All right, well, we're going to have a couple more people trickle in in the next few minutes. Let's get going. Um, I included it in the email, but I just want to make sure everyone has something to diagram plays with. We'll get to something later in the night, but whether it's a whiteboard or iPad or just a piece of paper and pen or, or marker. Um, so if you don't have that, just go run and grab. I'll, I'll give everyone another minute or two um, just to make sure we're set for that. Who? What's up, man? You see my blue notebook? Hey there, man. All good. How about you? Doing all right. Just finished family movie night, so nice. trying to come down from the sugar blue high. Notebook. What'd you watch? Uh, the the new Scooby Doo movie. How was it? Uh, the kids liked it. Good. <laughs> That's all that matters. Curse, what's up, man? Curse. No luck. Better? Nope. What are you trying to do? Ryan's trying to talk. Oh. Well, let's get going. And Ryan, you can try to figure it out. Um, so thanks everyone for joining tonight. I'm really excited about this week's collaborative learning series on the topic of offensive systems. Um, before we dive in, I just think it's important to say that I hope everyone's remaining safe and, you know, we're all keeping the healthcare community in our thoughts and prayers. Um, and even though the, the country is opening up slowly, like Jenny was just talking about, we're obviously still in some pretty scary times. So just continue to take the advice of experts and to practice good public health measures. Um, and as always, after this, I'd love everyone's feedback, just so we can cont continue to improve these sessions. Uh, we're going to do something a little different tonight in terms of explaining the vision of continuous coaching collaborative. So, Tommy, it it's all you. Hopefully, my internet won't freeze up too much. <laughs> but um, so we've been doing this for a while, and Joan has always let us in. And the other day, he asked me if I would, and I, I just was gonna talk about what it's meant to me, C3 um, and the, the different pillars of it. So starting with continuous, to me, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple. It's just an ongoing lifelong process of um, trying to get better daily. It never stops. That's, that's what it's meant to me. And that's what I think that all the people who've been a part of this, that's what it means to them. I think that's why we've extended it out to the people who we have. And that's why, that's why it's growing organically. Um, with the coaching part, when I think of coach, I think of teachers, I think of learning, and I think of the development of others. Um, not just those who we lead, but each other. We're learning from each other. We're teaching each other. And collaborative, working together for the betterment of all of us. Um, that's what that means to me. And I'm, I'm eager to, to hear from everybody tonight and continue to grow. And then what I learn from here, try to share it with someone else and help them grow as well. Thank you, Tommy. Um, 
I mean, you're, you're one of the people that really started this with me. And I think, you know, you as a person and just that explanation really embodies the, the spirit and the, and the nature of what I wanted when, when we started C3. So thank you for that. Um, just about tonight, we're going to get back to some X's and O's. You know, we've done some strategic things and some non maybe X's and O things the last few weeks. Um, so thinking about tonight's topic, offensive systems, I hope this conversation takes us a lot of different places, um, you know, from philosophical approaches to actual offensive structures and, you know, down to the specific plays. So I think we'll get some of that macro ap approach down to the micro stuff as well. Um, before we get to the speakers, I just want to caution everyone uh, of five points about offensive systems that, that I thought of when we put this week together. So number one, the game is not played on a whiteboard and everything's going to look really good tonight, but don't be fooled by that. You know, the defense we all know is playing hard and, and trying to negate anything and everything that we try to do offensively. So I'm not saying don't run your system and don't think about offense, but I think when we talk about offense, it's important to note that it's not being played five on up. Um, number two, when we talk about X's and O, you know, from the offensive perspective, I think it's better to think about how your team is running something, maybe more than, than what your team is running. And something we've said in the past is, oops, is there still feedback or is it good? All good? Okay. Um, something we said in the past is if you don't work, it won't work. So I always think about that when, when we put in offenses. And, you know, really for this point, like if your team can run a 1-5 mid pick and roll and you guys can execute the shit out of that with good spacing and the screener sprinting to screen and the ball handler is turning the corner and the screener is rolling hard and we're staying space and all those details that we know matter, you're executing. I think that that's way more valuable and definitely efficient than a, complex you know sexy spiffy new new play so just think about that number three we've seen this a lot in the nba but but teams are running more systems or, or structures and less explicit plays so the skill of being able to read a defense and the ability to adjust and play out of a concept instead of a specific play where maybe two goes here and three goes there and this guy screens here i just think that's become way more prevalent so with this freedom that coaches are giving to the players, I still think it's on us coaches to make sure that, that we've taught and drilled players enough so that they know which skills and concepts to use in which situations. So, you know, Pokey Chapman, who I worked for for four years, she always talked about principles of play. And these are really significant in the NBA. And I think teams are drilling these more. So a few examples of this are, on a side pick and roll, if the big bumps back and the ball handler throws to him or her and she swings it, then the big is immediately into a wide pin down for the initial ball handler or can follow the pass into a pick and roll. Another example of this is just a go and catch, playing off the catch, that 0.5 thing that a lot of coaches talk about. Uh, you know, another example of this is correct space and on dribble penetration. So whether it's driving middle and, and filling gaps or baseline drive, baseline drift. And one more example of this is what you're doing on post up. So your space and whether your team enters it and holds, whether you enter it and, and cut through, whether it's the middle or that baseline jet cut, or if you guys get into split cuts or that bill bow action, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other, but these are principles of play that I think you need to think about. And just think back to like the last really intense game you, you coached in. Maybe it's versus a rival or the best team in your league or a playoff game or, you know, the best defense in your league. But you guys know nothing comes easily offensively. The defense is definitely going to take away the first, maybe even second and third options. So now what? And the question we ask a lot is, are you teaching your team a play or, or are you teaching your team how to play? So, you know, to Tony Robbins said, complexity is the enemy of execution. And we know that our athletes, when they're thinking, they're gonna be slower. So they need to be in their hind brain, playing and reacting instead of their front brain, as Dr. Goldberg would say. 
Um, I'm a big fan of football coaches, so I'm just going to share two quick football um, coaches talking about this point. Um, so this first one is Sean McVay talking about the difference between capability and capacity. So it's one thing to train guys for capability. It's another thing to train them for capacity. Capability, guys can follow directions uh, if you give you know specific orders, but capacity is the ability to give them the contingency plans and the tools to be able to solve the problems, even if it's maybe something that you haven't gone in and, and you know really practiced throughout the course of the week because they have the ability and the cap the capacity, excuse me, to be able to use those tools to solve it. I, I heard at the league meetings a couple of years ago, a guy named JC Glick, he talked about it and it really painted a picture for me because he talked about, you know, you go through, you know, the the, the challenge for us as coaches. Coaches is to train guys for capacity over capability where when you have a you know a military unit that's training for a certain operation you go through the same steps you pull a tank in 10 guys get out on the left 10 guys get out on the right everybody flanks each side and you go in and you just follow those 10 steps you do it over and over again those guys become automatic what happens when you come into battle and shots are being fired from the right side of the tank do you have the capacity? Have you trained these guys for the capacity to say, hey, let's get 20 guys out on the left now so we don't immediately lose half of our men? Yeah. And that that resonated with me. And, yeah. and that's where I feel like I fell short for our team. And So I, I thought that that really explained it way better than, than I could. Um, moving on to number four, are you running your system be, because it is your system? Or you run your system because it benefits your players and puts them in the best position to succeed. And I don't know, Jenny might be touching on this tonight. Uh, I'm not sure. You're like taking my talk, Jonah. Well done. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But Carlisle's done a marvelous job of this. And, you know, you think back a few years back, they had one of the most complex. I got a video playbook of their 2011 um, somehow through, through someone, probably illegally. Um, <laughs> their 2011 video playbook and it's like some next level stuff and now they they have one of the simplest playbooks in the league but i mean that as a compliment you know they have Doncic, one of the top playmakers in the nba and obviously that style's maximizing the talent and the skill on their roster so i think it's a little you can you can sign some free agents and draft to a system in the nba and some teams do that more I think colleges, you can recruit for your system, maybe even more. You know, I always think about Bayheim getting those long defenders to play in the zone at Syracuse. Um, but just, I think you just have to recognize if the system you're giving your players benefits them or if it's just always what you've done. And it's good to be stubborn and to do what you believe in, but just be aware of this point. And we dealt with this in Sacramento. Like when you take a new job, and which we did last, you know, last summer, it means watching a lot of video and then seeing what the team and coach the year before did well and how were your players having success? How was Fox doing this? How was Buddy Heald doing this? And what can you build off of? I don't think you always need to start from, from ground zero, from square one. You can see what, you know, what your team was having some success with. And, and Tommy is a big Giants fan and I'm a big Patriots fan. So, this is a compromise. This is Joe Judge, the new Giants coach, talking about this point. Who? Who oh, is he? Coach. I'm still trying to figure out who he is. <laughs> he's your new huh? he's your head coach. I know who he is, but what did he ever do? I'm just kidding. I'm he just worked, kidding. I hope he, worked, he does a good job for us. He worked for Belichick. That's all he needs to <laughs> and, and Saban, actually. Is he bringing some of the Patriot players with him? That's the key. <laughs> <laughs> That's up to you. Belichick <laughs> was, was real. And what I learned from Coach Belichick was, was real simple. Be flexible within your personnel. Don't try to shove round pegs in square holes. Figure out what you have. Let them play to their strengths. Don't sit in a meeting and tell me what you don't have in a player. Don't tell me they can't do a certain thing. Tell me what they can do, and then we'll figure out as coaches, because that's our job, how we can use that. That's our responsibility. Everybody has something they can do. How many cast-offs you see around the league that up on another team and everyone says, wow, how'd they get that out of them? Maybe they just weren't closing their eyes to what they could do. 
Okay. We have to, as a coaching staff, when we get assembled, we have to make sure we're sitting down, we're patient with our players, we fully evaluate them, we find out what they can do to be an asset, and that we're not foolish enough to not use that. So, and just the last point I want to make, number five, our offense is adjusting and adapting to today's athletes and players. And in the NBA, we've, we've seen a lot of decrease in player and ball movement, and teams are just getting to that isolation or post up or spread pick and roll earlier in the clock and getting rid of all that bogus action before it and a really good example of this is the utah jazz i mean they still run some some complex stuff and they're very difficult to scout but they used to run all this motion and then they would get to the mitchell and gobert pick and roll or the Ingles gobert pick and roll but those years they they were towards the top in the, of the league in passing but the bottom of the league in offensive rating and now they get to that main action quicker. And I think I look, they're, they're eighth in offensive rating. So is that because they have better players maybe? Or is that because that system is getting to that initial action quicker? Um, and then I just think about how, how is the game going to continue to develop? You know, we're all watching the last dance. And it's crazy to me seeing the offensive spacing during, it was the 90s, right? It's, it's 20 years ago, you know, 20, 30, I don't know. 20 years ago, yeah, 15, 20 years ago, uh, maybe 25, how about that? <laughs> but a lot of it's inside the three-point line. So now, obviously, the last five, 10 years, um, the, the, the spacing has gotten more and the teams are playing faster and the threes. So is that going to stay the same? Or, you know, now the Lakers are playing with two big. So if they win, our team's going to try to match that. And are we going to see a, a team slow down? I just think it's important to keep those questions in mind. So sorry if I took your whole talk, Jenny. That, that's all I have. Um, <laughs> any questions before we dive in? Hey, can I ask you one? Yeah. Number four, yep. which I love, because when, when you get asked on interviews, like, how are you going to play this, that, and the other thing, my thing has always been, you know, who do we have? What do we have? What are we going to get? Like, I want to cater to what we have. Like, I have a blueprint for what I would love to do in a perfect world, but that's not always going to be the case of what you have when you're walking in or you're planning it or what, maybe what you ever get. How do, you, in, how do we say that in interviews where it doesn't sound like a cop? Like, I, it's not a cop out. Like, that's what we should be doing as coaches. We could even have the best intentions of thinking this is going to work this way and we find out it isn't and we have to deviate. But it seems like, when you see press conferences, especially in college, they're all the same. We want to play fast. We want to do this. We want to do that. And not everybody has that personnel. How, and maybe, maybe everybody can start, you know, weigh in, like, is that different in the pros, college, or, like, what does that look like? You're number four. Like, how do we explain that? Zach asked me this question yesterday, and we have, I guess we have three Zachs on this call. But yeah, I was going to say, which Zach? <laughs> Zach Hamer asked me that yesterday, and I said, he said, you're a head coach tomorrow. What system are you running? And I said, who's my team? Like, I said, I, I always would say that. But I, I would say this. And, like, I, you know, interviewed for a head coaching job last year. And what I did is I scouted the team. So I went back and I watched their offense. I watched their defense. I went through a personnel, just like it was an NBA scout that, that I had. And I think that's a really good place to start. Again, in college, I don't know – I would guess if a new coach comes in and now the transfer rates are just insane, but you, per, you might not even know your team. You uh, could, I mean, like you could do that process. I would do that process for sure. Like I would do that, you yeah. know, but you know, but it still might not, you know, what, what I might want to have done may not envision or what maybe someone wouldn't have done. And it's not that you're uncertain about it, but like you need to know what's going to this trial and error and what's going to work and what's not going to work. Absolutely. So, my answer and other people chime in, but is I, I have a frame, like you said, I have a framework on off makes. We, we want to run this off misses. We want to do this off dead balls. And, and after timeout, after free throw, we want to do this. But like, if I have a dynamic point guard or I have Shaq on my team, like it's going to depend. It's going to influence that so heavily. And I think you talk about that in your interview. Like I, I, I think that the best, I mean, Carlisle is, is the perfect example. He's one of the brightest offensive minds. And from the outside looking in, he's just simplified and given the keys to, you know, a top two or three playmaker in the NBA. Um, 
and you look, I mean, I know Jenny's close with Spolstra also, like you look at what they did with D Wade and Shaq, and then you look at what they did with LeBron and them, and now what they're doing, like to me, he's super impressive, not because his plays are the best plays of all time, but he just caters to his personnel. And I think that that going into an interview to me, I think in college, I always hear about, you know, this coach is a runs, you know, runs spread just say, or Princeton or whatever. It doesn't matter. And again, that's really good. But like, if you, if you coach a team for 20 years, I think that you're going to have some teams that are more athletic or better shooting or, you know, like they're, they're going to have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's on you to, to find out what those are and, and put the players in the best position to succeed. Someone and, else uh, speak up though. Cause I, can you hear me? Yep. Final. Right. Um, I just want, I actually want, I'm going to, uh, Tammy, can you, can you kind of chime in on this? Cause I know we've talked about this a little bit and like just in your role taking over last year um, in the team and just kind of how you kind of tweak some of your, what you've done historically offensively, what you wanted to do versus kind of what you ended up doing. Um, yeah. So I took over a team that, um, that wasn't, wasn't very successful the last couple of years and they took lots of really early shots and, um, just played really fast and um, they were just getting blown out of every game. So we had to come in and really slow things down. Um, not, not necessarily what I wanted to do, but what we needed to do with our personnel and uh, made, made a huge difference. So, you know, no quick threes, which, you know, about killed them at first. But when, when we started to look at the fact that they were shooting about 18% from a catch and shoot, you know, smell leather, put it up three and I explained we could have just handed the ball to the other team 82 percent of the time and actually we could have just thrown the ball out of bounds and then we could at least get back on defense mm -hmm. so I just started to rethink everything um they it took a little while for them to get it get understand the system that we were trying to do but we didn't have any choice we had 10 players um six or seven that could really play and we just had to slow the game down is that what you're talking about Ryan yeah, I just wanted to hear your perspective on that, on kind of Tommy's question. I thought, I, I think your perspective, again, you touched on it, but like maybe not how you would necessarily want to play, but kind of what was necessary to be competitive with the group that you had. Is that going to change with recruiting and eventually in a system, of course, but um, I think that's really good perspective for, for the question that Tommy had. Yeah, and I think ultimately, I think, and I think we're kind of all hit on the same thing, and I think Tommy's question's a good one of how does that change the interview dynamic, but like whatever you're running offensively, it better be, it better be good for your two best players and your two best players better be getting the shots that they want and they need. And to be honest, the other three guys, three, four, and five, maybe dependent on who screws them up the least or maybe who accentuates them the most. Like, but everything's predicated on those on those two guys, and you know who those two guys might be might vary from year to year. But like, it should that system should be friendly to them. Chip Kelly's got a line where he, you know, he kind of laughed at one point. He said, uh, "You know, one phrase I'm hearing around college football is a uh, quarterback friendly system." And he's like, "Oh, I'll get I'll give you a little hint. If your core, if your system isn't quarterback friendly, you should get a new system." Like. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's kind of like where I'm thinking is that, you know, everything should be in the lines of with, you know, through that lens. Um, um, what, what, maybe this relates to what maybe it doesn't. I just, I, I like this story. Um, this, this season for us made me think a little bit, maybe kind of re-envision how I think the game a little bit because, I was caught up not necessarily in analytics. That's not, you know, but I think one thing is at the college level, I think some guys have really taken the analytics that are true in the NBA and have taken it to be 100% gospel. And I just think there are some things that are lost in translation just in the extreme skill level in the NBA as opposed to college. Long story short, we took too many threes this year and we weren't a great range shooting team. We didn't have great 
Uh, we didn't have great three-point shooting. And we came off uh, – we were in a tough little spot. And uh, it was funny. I just listened to a podcast by Michael Marty where uh, he was talking about the Ravens had just lost in the uh, playoff game to the Titans. And they threw, like, 58 passes. And he said, up in the Ravens' law meeting, offensive meeting room should be, thou shall not throw 30 passes in a game. Because he's like, you just can't – if you're the Baltimore Ravens, what you do is you hand the ball off and you win that way. And, like, you can't win if you're throwing the ball 30 times. And we came off a game where I thought we had settled for a lot of okay threes. And it was funny. We put up a sign in our, in our locker room that said, that you know, thou shall not take 25 threes in a game. And, like, for me, that was complete departure from what I thought because my part was, like, Hey, if we're going to get open looks, let's well, let's get them. But that's just not who we were offensively. So kind of we had to change our approach. And for the rest of the year, that was like our thing. They kind of bought into it. Like, don't take 25 threes. Because our point was this: is we're going to win games by getting to the getting to the rim, which we're great at, and all that will lead to some good threes along the way. But we really want to live at the rim. I, you know, that so that kind of even within the season, kind of changing your plan a little bit. Um, I hope some people got something out of that because, you know, that, that was something that was revealing to me this year. I heard Stan Van Gundy talk about something really good a couple of weeks ago, saying your philosophy should never change, but your system should always cater to your players. So he's always an inside-out guy. That never changed whether he had Dwayne Wade, Karan Butler, Eddie Jones driving to the rim, and he got Shaq posting him up. Dwight Howard was pick and roll. He always found a way to get it inside. But that's his philosophy. Now the system always changed, and he just morphed it to the players. I like that a lot. Seth, were you going to say something? Yeah, I had a question that's actually kind of bounces off what what Zach was saying a little bit. Something I've always wondered, and and sort of not not being a coach, I don't uh, I, I don't have a, a good sense sense of this. Is that comes is, from the analytics world? So. The, no, um, but. Um, you talk about catering to your personnel. Are you, how do you draw the line between catering to what they can do today versus what they can do by mid season versus by the end of the season versus, you know, if you're, if you're coaching in, in the pros and okay, you're at the start of a building phase, uh, what, what you're going to want them to be able to do two years from now. Uh, does that make sense? Um, I, I've always kind of wondered how you, because obviously like the thing that's going to win the game tonight is it can be really different than what you want to teach. Seth Pardo asked me a question about analytics. Like that's about as good as it gets for me in 2020. So I'm, <laughs> I'm good. I'm going to sign off now. Um, <laughs> Seth, love your work, man. It's actually awesome. Uh, I love that you've kind of gone into this sector because uh, you know, we can, we can learn from you much more than when you were, uh, buried away by the Bucks, or, you know. Um, I think it's a great question. I think in the college level, it's a little bit different because college level, we know we're going to have them for four years. Um, and so there's an idea a little bit, where can this guy get to? And we're constantly thinking about pushing the envelope. But ultimately, by the time he's a junior and senior, you're a little bit settled into what he is. But I'll also say, because of – our low amount of games, it might be he – I mean, we had a kid this year. I mean, we he was, we knew he going into the year is our best player and is a really good guard. But like, what he was doing by the end of the year is something we couldn't even fathom, right? you know, even a month before or a month and a half before. So, that change, I'll say, might be a little bit uh, – those roles can adjust. I'm not saying, hey, you're always pigeonholed into that role. But I think ultimately um, you have an eye towards the future of what he can get to. But also, I think you need to constantly kind of be adjusting that. What, what's he giving you right now? And then also, as, as much as we can, can we get there, each guy in his strength, in his strength zones as much as possible? Um, and again, going back to, you know, you know, what I like, what mistakes I made this year and growth I made this year was like, just, you know, we had a guy and Pat and I were talking about this today about a guy, he was a non-shooter and I, I just wasn't, I wasn't experienced enough to kind of I just kept on talking to him like he could shoot and he was just and he was the same player as the guy next to him but ultimately he was a great athlete and he had a knack for cutting and in, in conference play we unleashed him as a cutter and he be, and he became a much better offense player and we became a much better off team as a result so I think as often as we can if we can get each guy playing in their strength zones and doing what they do really well while working really hard in practice on things they need to work on 
And it's almost like that delineation. That's where you need a mature player to understand, hey, I'm working hard on this weakness. But come game time, I, I want to stay in my strength zone as much as possible. Seth, I don't know if that answers your question a little bit, but that's kind of where I went with it. I'd love to hear what other guys had to say. I would well, just say – Oh, go ahead. Well, at the college my, level, at the college level all, or also you will incur some losses early. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like to, try to, like to try to set up the future, hopefully if you're secure enough in your position that that can happen. I mean, like, you know, it, it, it's – to add to what Zach's saying, I mean, like, there's no other, there's no other way to really do it. I mean, I, I took over a bad program. Division three is different. I took over, like, we were probably one of the worst, the bottom five programs in all of Division three. So, I mean, I knew coming in, like, you know, like, we got to recruit. <laughs> it doesn't matter what. It doesn't matter what I'm going to try to do. Uh, and, I, and, like, mostly I focus on, like, how, who are we going to be? And then when the talent comes in, then we could try to win some games. But I mean, like, you know, it was, it was, it, you know, trying to win games now is great, but, you know, I just didn't have enough. And like the different levels, like Division One with the transfer portal, different things like that might enable you to be a little bit more competitive early on. But like my level, I mean, that, that was it. I mean, it was, it was, a, and, and, and in the interview process, my boss explained, like, he knew it was a four or five years to get to whatever this, that, or the other thing. So I think it's a little bit of both. And I, I think collegiately, probably where the level is, can help you determine what route maybe you're going to go more so with. Yeah, I can piggyback off that a little bit. So before I was here at Lawrence as the head coach at Division Three Pennsylvania Lake Survival College for, for three years, and we had three different teams in those three years in a sense of, like, strengths and, and capability. And we were able to have pretty good success, but we changed everything almost every single year. So this being a young coach, I got a job at 26 years old. I was learning on the fly. I was constantly changing and tweaking. And that actually, I think, was detrimental to our team as well. So, like, where I've come to, here to Lawrence and kind of more developed the philosophy of, like, is your system flexible enough to adjust and tweak? Like, because now there's consistency for our guys, but also at the same time, we're able to, to tweak and adjust. Okay, if we have a true big here, if we have guards who are better at this, um, I think there's a lot of value in that because there's value in consistency, at least the Division three level where we don't have all off season. We don't have <clears throat> um, our, we have a, about a month to prepare. And if, if I'm always teaching them new systems, it's hard for us to get traction. So I've kind of gone more the direction of all right, this is like the the system. This is how we want to play, but that need better have enough flexibility within it to adjust to, to what we're doing. And then that's the lens that we can develop players through. That's the lens through which we can recruit. Um, and also, I think the other part of it, like at the college level, is like, where are you? Are you at a place where you have better resources and you can really go out and get the highest level talent? Or are you at a place where it's more, um, you don't quite have those resources and you need to have a system that sets you apart or you need to be really good developing players within a system, seeing guys that fit. Because um, if you're at a place where you can get high level players all the time, then all right, just get the best players you can, and we'll figure it out from there. Whereas sometimes there's, there's jobs where you have to be a little bit more intentional and creative with it. Hey, I think, is that? Go ahead, go ahead, man. I'm talking I was going to say, much Zach, with the, with the flexibility within the, the same system, it's like I think you give players an opportunity to grow and grow their visualization in the system. I think a big part of college and basketball in general is pl players being able to imagine themselves playing, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big part of developing feel. And when you continue to, like, change systems, it's hard for players to, like, see their identity as a player, right? That's, that's the biggest thing. Some of these young guys, they don't know who they are as players, right? Like, there's some guys on, on college teams that are getting recruited as a guard, but in real, in real life, like, they can't switch one through four, so they're five, like, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think when you keep the same system defensively and offensively, you give guys a chance to really develop in their own and, and visualize who they are as a player. And I, I, I think that's a huge part of, like, developing a team because then guys are growing together as a team too when they know who they are because they're comfortable with who they are as a player. So just to piggyback off that. Hey, Army Zach. I'm just calling you Army Zach since we got five Zachs on the phone today. <laughs> what, the same um, dude that thanks me for my service as a chick boy. Too, <laughs> One, like, my question for you is the, like, the revelation of, like, what your eyes were telling you versus the analytics. Like, how analytically driven is your program? So when you had this epiphany, how easy was – how quickly did you get off of, like, oh, shit, we, we shouldn't be shooting threes. Like, even though we want to play – like, numbers tell us yeah. to play a certain way. 
see there's a couple there's a couple things with that and like uh um where, where do i want to go with this um two things one is um i can almost balance both sides bill belichick's got a great point about analytics and he says analytics are great for your 53 47 and your 52 48 51 49 decisions that telling you which way to go but like, ultimately if it's anything more than that then you should have seen it on film anyways now, I also actually understand biases and I understand cognition and faults that we have as humans about being able to take a large data set and be able to make decisions and be able to spot discrepancies in areas. But like ultimately, like, you know, Tom Thibodeau has got a great line. He says, you know, what we used to call those analytics stats. And like, my point is this, is that like, you like analytics works hand in hand with video. And if you're waiting on analytics to tell you, you probably weren't paying enough attention to video after all. Um, so, TV, I, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but, like, um, I think it was more of a kind of intuitive sense because what it was was me looking at our team saying, eh, that's not a bad shot, that's not a bad shot, that's not a bad shot, but it's not a great shot. Or I should say that, you know, that's a, that's a fine shot, that's a fine shot, that's a fine shot. And then ultimately, yeah, but if we total 25 of those up, we, it's, not a, it's not good for us. And I think it was more kind of – it's using analytics, but it's also needing to have a sense if, for your team. And, and you know, um, I don't want to I don't, I don't want to sound like a hardo, but, like, in college, we're only having 30 games. I almost like – one thing I'll always say is, like, before you cite a stat, before you cite this analytic, did you watch the game twice? Like, like did it be – it's like you're going to find more in that film than necessarily – and then, and then use both and use them hand in hand. And, you know, a friend of mine has a great line. He says, um, use, use stats religiously uh, or, ortho, you know, use stats religiously as a staff and use, you, uh, use stats liberally to, um, to your players. In terms of whatever gets a point across your players, use that stat. But as a staff, you should have a very clear delineation of, like, these are the stats we're paying attention to. So we can just track them as we go. We're not going to just grab bag and just pick a stat that fits our narrative. And I think sometimes that's where people misconstrue analytics. And I love it for players. Say, hey, if like, you want to get a point across the player, boom, bust out anything you want. Go for it. Knock yourself out. But as staff, we really should stay consistent. We can't just cherry pick when it proves when we, when we think it fits a narrative that we want. And along the same lines, and I'm just getting pulled away, there's a book that I read that I absolutely love. Um, it's called The Inside Game. It's by Keith Law. Keith Law is a former, he was the assistant GM of the um, Toronto Blue Jays. And he might be the most smug person I've ever, uh, he's awesome. He's in, in brilliant. Yale grad, he's, he's, he's brilliant. I love him. He's incredibly smug. Um, and if you've tried to labor through thinking fast and slow and is way too smart for you, this is like a dummy's version of that through the lens of baseball, and it's terrific. And it kind of gets into some of the stuff we're talking about of how you're struggling dealing with some cognate, cognition and some cognitive biases that, inter, that impact our thinking and the way we make decisions. Before we're here all night. Um, can, I make one, can I make one more point about yeah. Zach's point? It's yep. really good. Like one, one thing is with your style of play or your philosophy, if you're in a tough job, like, hey, the law inversion, do what – eliminate what loses first. Yeah. Hey, what loses? What loses? Hey, giving up offensive rebounds, turning the basketball over, giving up transition baskets. Maybe if, you, if you're struggling talent, maybe it's not talking about what you want to do. Think about starting with the law inversion, Mike Lombardi. Take away what lo – you know, take away what loses. Bill Belichick, Monday morning, they asked one question to start every meeting. If they won, he says, why did we win? If they lost, why did we lose? he wants to dive into that about how can we eliminate losing. Seth, great call on the Undoing Project. The first chapter is amazing. I mean, the Undoing, Michael Lewis's Undoing Project, I actually, the, the first chapter is worth it. 40, the 41 pages do that. The rest of the books just found money. <laughs> I think, like, the last point on it is, and we talked about this last week, like you, you need to have alignment from ownership really down to the front office, down to the coaching staff. And I mean, I'm not going to try to get fined, so I'm not going to talk about my previous experiences, but at one place I was at, I don't think we had that. We'll just leave it at that. And then 
guys, like the players themselves get confused on what you want and they're getting mixed messages. So I just think in an ideal world, and that can be in college too, from a president and athletic director to, to, you know, head coach, assistant coaches down to the staff. And then like, I know the Bucks, Seth, when you were there and they're one of the best teams in your player development, like, do you know where players are getting their shots from? Because then in your system, that's really how, and Zach, you were talking about this, um, Phil's and Zach, not Army Zach, <laughs> but then I think there can be, imp- I mean, you're going to get better over four years, you should, but like, how are you getting better and, and, and in what system? So if you know you're getting these shots and you're handling in these types of pick and rolls, like, you know, we have Luke, Luke Cornett on the call with us and say what you want about the Bulls this year, but they ran four plays offensively and they had two or three options out of each one. And you knew it when you were playing them and they knew it, but they knew where their shots were coming from. They knew where their, their uh, you know, what, which plays they were going to run. Luke, you can comment or you don't have to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Confirmed, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that's a great question. Let's uh, – I mean, Zach, you've talked a lot already. Tommy, you, you can say anything about him if you want, if you want to introduce him. But, but um, first of all, Zach, you can go wrong. Like, you can't, you can't go wrong with us. Like, you know, we, we've had some sessions going to, like, 2 a.m., so we're the long hauls here. But um, – when we started doing this and Jonah was like letting us know about people, I, I mean, Zach came to mind right away. I met him, I can't even remember how many years ago. I'll never forget, I was working five star camp, station 13. And um, I don't even know what you were doing, Zach. What were you doing? Canteen? I don't know how we filling, had you filling, in the filling, filling water coolers. At least it's Christ. That Probably was be like the next Adam Cohen. Guess what? Like, you should not have been doing that even then. And he just asked, like, can I come out and help? And I, I mean, like, you know, of course, like, that's how I got started. Somebody just brought me along. And it's, it, we've just been collaborating ever since then. And, and I'm, just, I'm just glad that he's going to be part of this. And I'm going to shut up. And, Zach, you can talk as long as you want because um, you're going to just really just be everything that what 3C stands for is, is, is what you do, man. So I'm, I'm really proud of where you come and, like, where you're going to go. And I'm excited to learn tonight. I appreciate it, TV. And- you did a lot for me early. I, I don't know. I probably owe you several McDonald's Happy Meals. Yeah, that, that, that was the currency back in the day in terms of what I was eating as a poor college kid. So. Hey, it's it's still a currency for a D3 administrator right now, too, with three kids. <laughs> there, there, there you go. There you go. Um, so when, uh, when Jonah hit me about offensive systems, I figured we'd get into our uh, secondary series, and we made a clear change. We had played very fast for uh, a long time here at Army, and, and frankly, we played it to – we achieved – we played fast, but we weren't necessarily efficient, and I, I think we were kind of – we were being baited into some um, into some low efficiency possessions, and we tried to play fast both on makes and misses, and, um, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested here in the NBA game what the analytics say. In the college game, um, the first 10 seconds, of sh- uh, the first the first half part of the shot clock um, in the college game off a make isn't a, isn't an efficient isn't an efficient place to live, and like the teams that routinely try to play in that area um, of the top 20 in the country that were most active in the first 10 seconds of shot clock falling a miss. Um, I think only of the first of the top 20, I think only five of them had effective field goal percentages over 50% in that area. So we had to be honest with ourselves about um, where we were and what we were trying to do off makes. And essentially one, another point was you can't beat the best teams in your league trying to run on makes um, in our mind Um, that the best teams in your league aren't going to give up good looks in the first 10 seconds of shot clock phone and make, they're going to get organized and they're going to still like, so you're going to, they're going to lull you into taking bad shots or maybe not lull and, you know, and, and um, coach uh, um, made the point earlier about her, the team she took over. Um, and so we, we made a drastic change. So uh, we actually, our transition offense off misses was good to us and we kept that. But we, we made the decision that we we're going to play completely different off makes, and we were going to call a secondary action every single time down. 
And um, so what we, uh, the, the formation uh, that we got to was always going to be the same, but the, um, but the, the, what we did off, it was always going to be called. So this isn't um, nothing you haven't seen before. I just want to pull this up. It was going to be always a five out look with our five man was always going to take the ball out. And he was, um, he was always going to run to the top of the key. Our four man was always going to be weak side wing. And then our wings were, were, were going to be um, in either corner. So they're both trying to fill a corner uh, as fast as we could. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to get to that formation um, as, you know, on every make um, and the four just need to read the one and get to this, the side opposite of him. Um, that, and, and I don't want to get into our, I, I want to be able to cover everything here today with the makes. Um, I would say that was very, very different than what we did off misses. We, we didn't run a number break off misses. We got out wide, played on the rails, uh, tried to put pressure on the corners, tried to put pressure on the 45s. And essentially we tried to leave the middle of the floor open because we had the best guard in the league. And we tried to leave that middle of the floor completely open for him. and. Um, that was, uh, you know, so it was completely different than what we did off off misses. But uh, um, this is uh, that was what we ended up falling for off, uh, you know, off makes. So I'm gonna get in some video. Um, Zach, Zach, quick, quick yes. question. So you guys, it was just easiest for you to simplify it. The five on any make, the five is just gonna get it. The five is generally closer to the basket for defense yeah. rebound, and, and you guys. That just- that was that was our thinking. Um, I, I, I worked for a uh, great coach. The best coach I ever worked for was a guy, Tim Kloos, who just retired at Iona. And he played for Frank Morris um, at St. Agnes. And Frank Morris is the guy that Rick Pitino and Billy Donovan learned the break from. And so Tim was a guy where he always had one guy to take it out and only one guy took it out. It was their job. And it was, it was like Pavlov dog where that guy was, um, that guy was foaming at the mouth and, you know, itching to get the ball out and it was on fire. I'm not even saying that's right or wrong. Uh, for us in the Patriot League, it's, it's you know, and Jimmy will tell you, it is a four-out, one-in league to a five-out league at times. But, like, you're four, if you're four is taking it out, might as well have anyone take the ball out. So, for us, it was actually a way to get organized. And this is – so our, our kind of approach to it was we wanted to get organized and run an action – as fast as we could into the clock. Now we didn't want to take a shot as fast as we could, but our, our idea was, can we get organized? Can we get to an action as fast as we can? And we, so we felt and Jonah, that's a great question because it leads me into that a little bit. We felt that the, the half, the, the fractions of a second that it might've been easier for someone else to take it out. It wasn't, we weren't trying to shoot down that end as fast as we could. We were just trying to get organized and get to an action as fast as we can. So if that allowed us to get organized, you know, so be it. I actually think, you know, I can go one of two ways. I ultimately think if you want to play really fast on makes, just have anyone take the ball out. That's my opinion. Uh, but Tim really ground that into me. And actually, Zach, we, uh, I was working at Iona when you, uh, when you guys came, you were on that Buffalo team in 2011, right, Zach? Yep, yep. You guys were running spread ball screen and no one had seen it before. And everyone, like, yeah, everyone was like, That's what cool. the hell was this? It was awesome <laughs> to see. It was, I mean, Reggie Weatherspoon's such a good coach, guys. You want to become a better Great. coach, watch more rather Reggie Weatherspoon. Best passing team in the country. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, but you guys ran that stuff, and it was like – I had never seen it before. I was like, this is awesome. He got you so many shots off that flare screen. Holy crap. Yeah, I, um, I was pretty thankful. Pretty thankful. <laughs> there you go. Um, um, so, that my, my point, Joan, is that I think another way gets you to play a little bit faster. We want to get organized. We want to get to an action. By the five-man taking the ball out, that dictated the five-man was always at the top of the key. It's funny. You NBA guys, I put that spacing up, and you think delay. It's really funny. You're going to see about ten different series we got to. Our five-man just wasn't very good with the ball like that. So the one series we didn't get to was actually delay. Like, we never played delay. And that's the one thing when you see that formation, you're like, oh, they're going to play delay. That's the one we didn't play because he was just not great at that. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to go through the series. I'm going to go through our actions, and then we can, we can pop around, uh, and, uh, and we'll, walk, we'll, we'll go through it. All 
Uh, here we go. Give me one second. Yeah. All right. Can you guys see my, can you see a video up on the screen now? Yep. All right. First thing we did was just the way you guys have seen it. Again, this was a call every time down the floor. Um, and it was something we were a little bit curious about on how it would work. We never really ran into it, um, save for our high major game against Villanova. We resorted a little bit to hand calls, but it actually, it just never gave us a problem. We played two games a year with, you know, at Navy uh, where the place is packed and, you know, never gave us problems. So at all times, it was me calling out the action on a make and just you, you naturally got pretty good at kind of reading the floor, reading where guys were, because we had different, we had different guys. We had, you know, our, we had, we played really um, three guys between the two and the two and the three spots. And one was a non-shooter, the other two were shooters and just, you could get a kind of an idea about where the ball was, you know, what action got him to what hand, and you, you kind of, you just kind of get naturally get the feel of it a little bit. So away, nothing you haven't seen before. We're staggering away, and we're we're, pull, we're playing out of that. But again, everything is out of that spacing. Everything's out of that five out spacing, and all these calls are out of that spacing. So we coming down. That ball goes to the net. I have an idea in my head of what you know what we're gonna get to. And it might, you know, there might be a little bit of, hey, if it's on this side of the floor, it's on that side of the floor. I'm, I'm reading it a little bit. But that is our away series that you guys, are, you know, obviously seen. It's been a big thing in the NBA. One thing that we got a ton out of out of this away was this sneak drive. Uh, Eric Bledsoe with the Bucks is better than anyone with this. As you go to double away for these guys, then all of a sudden 34 staring at his head. And so this kid right here with the ball three was the best point guard in the league. And so anytime he saw uh, the X fives back on this away screen, it was a sneak drive. Or if he saw the point guard's feet cheating towards the away screen, we'd tell him to beat it away from it. But this sneak drive was really good to us as the year went on. And that way, you know, that was a, uh, that was an Eric blood. So uh, he's better than anyone at it in NBA. So um, again, and then we have all we have all specials out of this series, and these specials are being called. So this next one was away twirl. So we that ball goes to the net. I'm calling away twirl. The point guard sometimes is making that call. They you know is sometimes reiterating it with a hand signal. But for us, this is away twirl. So away twirl starts in the same way as away. It's going to be a double way, but there is going to be a dribble handoff on that on that strong side of the floor, and now. Again, it builds up off of that. So it was dribble handoff, hit the cutter off of that. Now the point guard's coming through, and you get to a side pick and roll. Get to a side pick and roll with our two best players. Again, getting your two best players. So this was action that looked like the same. It looked like a regular away series. There was a little hand. There was a dribble handoff on the strong side, and it got us into an action for our two best players. And this is where our two best players were running – running side ball screens for four years. This is a concept we talked about a ton. If a guy beats a screen over the top, just being able to flip and set that rescreen for him, coming back the other way, it was just getting your two best players in that action. Away twirl again. So again, everything's built off. I mean, the, the big thing was for us was things looking the same early in the clock and then look, and then be, having a slight change on it, you know, at the end. So for us, this is a way twirl hand. This could be a read by them. Anytime our big came up with a fist, that was him coming up saying, I'm setting a ball screen. Anytime he came up with an open palm, an open hand, that was him saying, hey, come throw me the ball and we'll play get game. All right. And um, that was a read by the big. If he didn't have great, if he didn't have great, um, 
separation as he sprinted up to that screen. Oftentimes he would play to that. He would call for that hand. Or if he, as he sprinted up, he recognized that wasn't a guy that was great handling the basketball. He'd call for that get game because now all of a sudden that takes the emphasis, that takes a ball handling emphasis by the guard to set up that screen. And now he can use his feet to create that same separation. So for, the, for us, a way twirl hand was the same play, but with a call dribble handoff. There, Funk makes a read, cuts away from it. Good cut by our uh, cutter right there. Charlie was our word for counter. I actually stole that from uh, Jimmy Oakman's old boss, Joe Jones. Remember that? And now this looks like the same, but the ball's going back. The, ball go, uh, the ball's going back. So, again, my whole the whole thing was this, is how quickly can we get to an action with everything looking the same? So right here, Navy, this looks like exactly what they just guarded. They, we had just run away, twirl. Now we're going right back to the counter. And any of this video, any of these diagrams, I can get to people. Um, all right, next series for us. Again, so we had, that was our away series. We had five plays out of that away series. The nice thing about this is they can also function out of ATOs as well. But I'm showing here, this is everything we're going to see today is really off makes. Next series for us was, again, same alignment. Two or three in the corner, two or three in the other corner, five at the top of the key, four away. And now one's hitting, and we're screening down. We're screening our, for our four who had ability to post. We're looking to get them a, we're looking to get them a post up. And then we're going to screen the screener with a roll replace behind. Same action. Now this is Cougar swing. Again, ball goes to the net. I'm standing up. Cougar swing. Cougar swing. Now starts the same way. But now Cougar swing means rather than screen the screener, we're going to play through the five man and go side pick and roll. Again, special player. How can we create action early in the clock? And we now – Pace was still important to us, and that was something we always kind of had to keep our keep a finger on their pulse on, and that making sure we were playing with good pace um, and good thrust in the clock. But we weren't doing it necessarily to get shots up. We were doing it to uh, to arrive with good pace, with good thrust, and get to an action early. For us, this was our Dallas action. That was a one-five screen. First thing we're looking for is to post that five. And there's a read element to almost all of this. Some of these sets more so than others. But if we, you know, two is looking for the five here. If you can't throw it to him, ball's past the one. And now we play out of that with to a middle pick and roll. How quickly can we get to action? Dallas, again, he looks at the five, doesn't have it. Now we just got him on the back cut getting downhill. Now we throw back. Dallas strong. Same cut to start, same same setup to start it. Now rather than now rather than coming off playing middle pick and roll, that initiates a flex cut for our two man. Dallas strong, just quick small things at the end of plays coming out of the same alignment. Mike Leach talks about there's two ways to be complex. You can run a lot of actions out of the same formations, or you can run or you can run a small amount of actions out of a bunch of different formations. For us, we we're going to run the same actions out of different formations, and we're kind of then threw it on top of itself as well. Dallas Strong, Charlie, and one thing that's great is our terminology really ended up catching on for our guys in that Charlie for us was always a throwback post up the backside. Down was always a ball screen into a down screen. Mesh was always a fake handoff to a misdirection post. So they could even think it a little bit. And that's where – and I really admire NBA coaches because I think you guys do such a good job at that level of spending a lot of time and making sure you are organized and your language makes sense. That's something I'm very envious of and we try to do this year, that it makes sense for your players and it gives them time. So Dallas Strong, Charlie, we're trying to throw it back. Again, the same action. We're coming back and posting them up on the backside.
and something to watch and I'll kind of keep talking as we go through it. Um, this was the mesh action. So this is a misdirection post up. This is a really nice action. We stole this from Colgate actually. Jimmy, you guys will, you, you'll remember this. Fake handoff and with a coming right underneath to get it. One thing is, you know, I'll kind of let this play as we go. Um, well, I'll pause for one second. Like Milwaukee plays at the same five out, but they are so completely positionless in that. Um, we thought about that. Ultimately, we want to give guys different position. Or we want to give guys a little bit more rigidness about what spots they could go to because we thought we could run more action that way where we if we if we thought if we completely were positionless one it didn't fit our personnel two we didn't think that a guy could learn as many we couldn't get or I should, I should say because of guys having to learn more spots we couldn't get as complex with actions uh, as we could if everyone had you know the four only needed to know one spot the two and the three both need to know two spots but there was enough positionally where they played those spots any you know different spots anyways um, but that was our thinking a little bit. Detroit, any time in which our point guard, like lots of times, uh, sometimes would happen where our two and our three would run the same side of the floor together. Anytime that happens, um, anytime that happens, the point guard just makes sure he's away from them. Oftentimes it would happen away from the ball, and that would trigger either a double ball screen or a single ball screen. So essentially, anytime Funk saw spacing he didn't like, he could just call push, which was a drag ball screen, or Detroit, which was a double drag ball screen. So anytime he didn't, he thought there was funky spacing. He could just bring it. He could just bring that guy over. Um, Detroit was our double ball screen with our four and our five. Michigan was a double ball screen with our five and our two. Just small, you know, just a small thing where he could call it Michigan, and that that knew the guard. A guard knew he was in that. That's our double ball screen. I'm not. I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, we would mix in some weak side action. Any ball screen. Uh, we try to reject as many ball screens as we use. Um, and, and one thing we'll try to do is we always try to – we stole this teaching point from Randy Bennett. We try to beat every ball screen one-on-one -on -one away from the screen. One-on-one -on -one away from the screen. We don't talk about setting up ball screens. We're beating the ball – the one-on-one -on -one away from the screen. And if he cuts you off, you've just made the best ball screen setup you could possibly do. Um, and something we actually stole from De'Aaron Fox, who's actually better at it, I think, the year prior – um, I might be mixing up those years is anytime we ran double drag, or we ran a drag with an empty corner funk got really good at trying to win that foot race, to the baseline. And that would one set up his ball screen or two, he would flip his hips and turn it on what we call Barkley, which is a dribble drive into a post up and set him up in that big <coughs> would come down and really set it at a low angle. You're going to see them in our push and our in our in our single drag clips a lot. You'll see that coming up. Two things we did out of uh, the double drag that I really liked. We called this action hokey. In our double drag in our regular Detroit series, it doesn't matter who went first. Could be the four, could be the five. For us, four man always popped, five man always rolled. Um, just we want we didn't want there to be any hesitation with that. And ultimately, it put us in some funny spots because at times. We actually played a shooting five, and he, we just – and so there's something a little bit lost in that, but I think it cleaned up uh, – it cleaned up. There was no hesitation uh, outside of that. Um, Detroit Hokey was a call for us where the four goes first, the five goes second. And this is a – we got more out of this play, and it's, it's dumb and it's simple. We got more out of this play than any play on the year. And for us, the four would either set it or – ghost it to the corner and the five would just slip this ball screen early and I'll, I'll let you see these because you, so you can see the reads and this sounds dumb I mean this is amazing how often we got this five man on this layup. just because four is that high bump and, and I really like this action Zach Hammer and I have talked about this a little bit of like this high single side bump he ends up getting stuck there and he ends up staying on his man and that five man's all the way that five man's open on that roll. And it's like on this clip right here, the same thing happens, but now the, you know, the Buffalo pulls the guy all the way over from the weak side to help on the roll. Now paint touch kick one more. And now we're playing. So for us, that was Detroit Hokey four first, five second. 
You just see that five man's open because X4 is pulled all the way up the court. Last play um, out of this series. Again, this was Michigan, all right? This was five first, two second. I, I know this is a lot of, you know, one thing is I'm, re- I'm impressed with our guys. This was something we were a little bit worried. How much can we put on them? I mean, at the end of the year, we had 40 secondary options that if all went to the basket, we could call. Now, there's some that are more popular and more prevalent than others, but um, th- it was something that our guys really adjusted to well. Five first, our two man was second, and we're going to slip underneath this. This is a very popular concept in college basketball this year. Uh, Creighton did it. Uh, Ohio State did it. Um, this uh, Colorado State, you know, this 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 was a concept that kept popping up in college basketball, where it's a double ball screen, and the second guard ghosts it to the rim, ghosts it, and for us, a ghost is a slip to the perimeter, and he ghosts it underneath the five on his roll. It's almost like an empty side roll replace. Again, same concept almost as the hokey action where that it's a, it's a high single side bump without that guy really knowing he was there. With it, and when I say the guy, I mean the guy on that single side bump, he's so high and he's not able to help on that role. So this for us was Michigan. Detroit was with four and five. Michigan was with the two and the five. Push was it's just bad. a single – yep. Hey, I might give you a quick uh, intermission. Yeah. Just, just so we can get uh, – Jenny's got an early morning, so I want to give awesome. her enough time. Awesome. Um, and then we'll come back when she's done. No, good, good natural break. Exactly. Too much video and we get – we get, you know, us NBA guys, we can only watch video for about two and a half minutes. <laughs> and, then our, and then our OCD kicks in. So, um no, really good stuff. Uh, I'll just introduce Jenny real quickly. Um, I was in the NBA, WNBA for two of the three years. She was head coach of the Seattle Storm um, and was always a really big fan from afar. I know I have Anthony and Jesse on here who worked with me um, in Chicago. And her team was a pain in the ass to scout, and they ran some really, really good stuff. Um, so we had the chance to meet a couple of years ago, and she's always been very gracious to me. and. I think a lot of you guys know she was with the Kings for a year and is finishing up year two with the Mavericks now. Um, and I just want to applaud her, you know, her braveries for, for breaking down some barriers in the NBA and also celebrate the fact that now probably her, her toughest job, yeah, most rewarding job is being a mother. So happy Mother's Day. Happy, happy late Mother's Day. Um, but Jenny just really embodies being a continuous learner and, and fits our continuous coaching collaborative vision. So. I'm happy she, she, she's here with us tonight, and take it away. No, Jonas, it's an honor. Like, this is such an awesome program, guys, and I'm, I'm, I am such a big believer, and the best coaches just are very hungry to keep learning. I mean, Rick's a great example of that. He's always evolving. He's always asking questions. He's always seeking um, new ways of looking at things. You know, I had the, the real blessing of becoming good friends with John Wooden, and to the day he died, we would talk on the phone. I mean, he's like 100 years old. And he would ask me, what are you learning? And I'd say something, you know, I'd be nervous. And then I'd ask him back, like, what are you learning? And to the day he died, he always had something. And so this is really just an awesome thing. And just the stuff you guys are saying, I mean, you're clearly like great minds. You know what you're talking about. Um, you know, I don't plan on being long. Jonah reached out a couple of days ago, so I really haven't had time to prep. I've had a lot on my plate the last couple of days, but he just asked me to share a little bit about offensive philosophy. And I'm just going to touch on a few things. Again, y'all have already mentioned a lot of the key things and then open it up to questions before, before I have to run. Um, but, you know, I'm in total agreement with what you guys are saying. I think um, it is important to, to have like your stuff, you know, if you're a copycat coach and you're just copying what a lot of other people do, you're never going to have a deep enough understanding to teach it well enough. So there, are, there has to be some, some stuff that's your stuff that, that fits your philosophies and your identity, whether it was your identity as a player or what you believe in as a coach, you know, we have to have that, that those convictions. Um, you know, I, I've been a head coach twice. The first time I inherited a veteran team in Sacramento and half the team was older than me. 
and uh, and it was a su successful veteran team, and they had a very clear identity that was established. They'd won a championship together. They'd been to a finals together, and I wasn't going to come in, especially as a 31-year-old head coach, um, and try to change things, you know. So my job was to accentuate their strengths, as you mentioned, and really to just solidify that identity that they already had. Identity is a huge thing. Um, is being able to diagnose the identity of your players and of your team. You're not, you're not, and you guys probably know this from relationships, you're not going to change people from their core identity. And so a lot of times I think we make that mistake trying to make players into what we want or need them to be instead of like really diagnosing this is who this is. And this is the best version of them. And it's my job to bring out the best version of that player and then do the same thing for your team. So like my team in Sacramento, for example, was, was built on athletes, long defenders. They, play, they hard hedged every screen. They, they fronted every post up and denied every high post. I mean, it was a crazy system that they, and they didn't want to change it because they'd been to two finals in a row and won a championship. So I had to learn their defense which was nuts and super high energy and required a, a very specific type of athlete. But those same athletes were not very offensively skilled. Uh, we had two shooters. They were over 40% three-point shooters. And that was about all I had offensively other than these athletes. So our offensive identity had to become a playing off our defense, getting as generating as many steals as we could and scoring off of our defense, um, getting these two snipers, a lot of shots, so a lot of off-ball screening action where my other players were screening um, and, and staying, you know, near the rim and then offensive rebounding. So we led the league in three-point percentage. We led the league in offensive rebounds, and we led the league in steals, and that was our identity. So my job now, once I had diagnosed the identity of the team, is now to build systems that accentuate those those strengths and are consistent and aligned with the identity. So now everybody has the vision. You know, we have to have as coaches what I call bifocal vision, where we have like the long term, like, you know, if you're building a house, like you design the, the whole blueprint of the house, like the finished product. And it's, it's everything. But then you have the end in mind, but then you go back and begin. And you go through the steps to, to get there. And it could be a multi-year plan. Hopefully we, we have that time, but you begin with the end in mind and then you go back and begin. But from day one, you're selling that vision. You're selling that vision to the people above you, around you, meaning your staff, and then quote unquote under you, your team. So it's really, really important. We have the identity, we have the bifocal vision and that we can sell that to everybody every second of every day. And that everything that we do systematically is consistent with what we're selling. So if your defense is based on like in Seattle, we had, I, I, I took over a rebuild. So it's a little bit different situation. I didn't inherit a team. I took over a rebuild, a complete rebuild starting from zero. And I was in charge of personnel as well. And so in that case, I was able to say, okay, and Jonah, this is a great exercise for, for anybody who's not been a head coach. Like you should have like your dream team. Like if you could pick your players, your type of player, personality of your player, personality of your team, identity of your players, identity of your team, and run whatever systems, you know, that you could run, what would be your ideal? What would be your dream vision? You know, because you might, you might have that opportunity. And it's good to know that because I think that's, you start there and it's, you can work backwards from there in terms of your philosophies as a coach. So I got an opportunity in Seattle. I had Sue Bird, who was, you know, towards the tail end of her career, although it's, it's now going longer and longer. Um, and I knew she was going to be with me and that was it. Every, everything else was, was on the table and we needed to lose, you know, realistically to get in the Brianna Stewart sweepstakes. But I put together a five-year plan of getting that team from last place in the WNBA the year before I took over into championship contention in five years, which is very ambitious. There are many franchises in the WNBA that have never won a championship, but I laid out a vision for my owners um, and everybody in the organization that if we can follow this plan and this process and we can subscribe to this identity, um, these, this offensive system, this defensive system, this 
championship culture and I had six pillars to that culture and we go after this type of personnel that will fit together in this way and these systems will accentuate them then we'll be in championship contention I mean obviously if things go our way in the lottery we'll be in championship contention within five years that team won a championship in year four we made the playoffs in year two which is unheard of in a rebuild and won a championship in year four um, but it was based on the vision that uh, started with being in the WNBA for a long time and knowing what culture and what systems I believed would win. And when it came to the offensive system, I knew what type of players I needed to fit together in the system. And I, I knew that, that uh, the type of system that would eventually become unscoutable in the WNBA. I also knew that it was a multi-year install. And so I wouldn't take over this rebuild without a, a certain length of contract. Um, because I knew like this is a complex system that you, they're, they're not going to be able to absorb overnight. It's, it's something that's got to be layered upon layered upon layered to get to the point where it's unguardable and unscoutable because our reads will become automated and feel, but feel very, very random and unpredictable to the defense where, where we know what we're doing and we're playing at a pace that's, that we know what we're doing, but they don't. I think pace is really important to a good offense. Doesn't matter what you're doing, but the caveat is playing at the fastest possible pace without losing efficiency. And a lot of being a good offensive team, defensive team too, is not, and you guys have touched on this necessarily exactly what you're running, but like Jonah mentioned, how you're running it, but even more so how you're teaching it. And I studied before I took over this rebuild, uh, this, the latest research in science in the best learning environments, the most effective learning environments that lead to the deepest teaching. And then I talked to Sue Bird for months about it, and she was sold. And so we entered into this together, Sue and I, because if you have your best player on board with you, you know, as a head coach, you, you're, it's going to be a lot easier to sell everything else because players care a lot more about what their peers think than what you do. I don't care who you are. They care about their, what their teammates think a lot more than what they do their coaches. And so we have to sell our, our most influential players on what we're doing before we present it to the team. So I sold Sue on this learning environment that, that is a little bit different than traditional learning styles, learning environments in our classrooms in this country and on our courts and in our sports settings. And then we went with that and we, we, we just tried it. And like I said, by the end of the season, the team didn't even need me because of the way we had taught, the way we had learned. Within games, they didn't need me. Within, by the end of the season, they didn't need me. And after I went to the NBA and was let go in year four, they won a championship without me continuing to run my stuff. They told the coach that took over, just stay aside. We like what we're doing and we need you to just stay out of the way because this is clicking for us right now. We're in year four, this is clicking, stay out of the way, we're getting ready to win this thing. But it was the teaching style. And I'd like to spend a little time, and we can go back to offense as much as you want, um, but just a couple nuggets about, about these teaching techniques that I think are really, really helpful. Some of them you already know, so I'm gonna like buzz through some of the obvious ones that I think are more, more known, um, starting with just the importance of continually keeping your players uncomfortable and out of their comfort zone. You know, we know that if you're not uncomfortable, you're not getting better. But having an environment where your players are comfortable being uncomfortable, where they are, they feel like a true freedom to make mistakes, and you allow for processes to, however long they take, to run its course without micromanaging and, and worrying about how it might be making you look, is very important. And that's that starts with us as the leaders, um, because our ego can get in the way sometimes of that type of learning environment. Second thing, um, you know, with that is, um, you know, they've done a lot of studies, like if you're, if you have two classroom settings and with one classroom setting, let's say you have a week to learn material and you guys take this, take these Danny? Day seven, you test them. Oftentimes, that's how we coach. We hey, teach, 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 then we have a game. Hey, Jenny, can you start that part? Oh, yeah. I just broke up for a second. Okay. Um, 
So one of the most common ways that, that we teach is so like, like I'm take two classrooms and I'm going to take the most common way that we teach, which is we have, we have an exam in seven days. So day one, I'm going to teach you the material day two, I'm going to teach day three, day four, day five, I'm going to teach. And then day seven, we test. And we often coach that way where we're going to teach, 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 teach. And then we play a game and we don't, we don't, we don't realize it, but there's another method. So another classroom setting, they have a week, they teach the first day, day two, they test. They give them the feedback from the test. Day three, they test, get the feedback. Day four, test, day five, test, day six, test. And on day seven, they test. The group that has been tested for a week blows the group that was taught all week out of the water, like blows them out of the water in performance every single time. And we do a lot of teaching sometimes and not enough testing. And the only testing our players are really getting is in the game. And we can expedite their learning process a lot quicker um, if we'll test a lot more in practice. And ask them questions and put them in situations to figure out things before we give them the teaching. So again, an example of that, if I were to ask all you guys right now, and anybody who knows the answer to this, raise your hand. And if whether you know it or not, at least guess and write it down on your paper. Okay, what is the capital of Australia? Okay, so take a guess, write it down on your paper. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, but write something down. The capital of Australia. So everybody have a guess? Okay, anybody want to say their guess? Melbourne. Melbourne, good guess. Er. Adelaide. Er, good guess. Canberra. Canberra, good job, Seth. Okay, now the, the point of this exercise, okay, the capital of Australia is Canberra. The fact that I asked you the question first and gave you an opportunity to think about it and like, run through some cities you know in Australia and guess something, even if you guess wrong, you're way less likely to forget that the capital of Australia is Canberra than if I just said to you guys, hey, just FYI, the capital of Australia is Canberra. Most of you guys wouldn't remember that in a month or a year or five years for sure. But now, likely most of y'all will never forget that the capital of Australia is Canberra. Again, a lot of times we talk a lot to our teams in video and in practice and they're passively receiving information or not but if we would spend more time asking questions and again creating an environment where they're not afraid to say the wrong thing or they're not afraid to make a mistake and do the wrong thing and giving them opportunities to problem solve situations before we give them the answer then by the time we do give them feedback they're way more open to it and the ground this has been softened in their brain neurologically to receive it a lot deeper. So think about situations, you know, like let's say you're getting ready to go against a team that, that hard hedges pick and rolls, you know, or let's say it's a team that goes under pick and rolls and you haven't really seen a lot of teams that are going under or sliding. If before you tell them the counters, you put them in three on three or two on two or whatever and you have the defense doing that, and then you try to, you ask them to try to figure out what's a good counter to that. Okay, they're going to be switching off ball screens, right? So let's let's set up four on four. I'm going to run a floppy action, and the defense is going to switch. And you guys try to figure out a counter to that before you tell it to them. Then even if they fail miserably, just the exercise will get them talking, get them thinking the game, get them trying to think in a problem solving way, training their brain to work that way because you're not always going to be out there with them. And so their brain is just getting trained to think the game, own the game, communicate with each other, not be afraid to make mistakes. And then when they can't do it or they're not successful, or then when you chime in with a little tip, they're way more hungry for it and they'll, it'll, they'll learn it way deeper. So there's a million contexts and ways you can use that principle, but it's, you know, it's, I think it's helpful um, to know you know, letting them figure things out before you give them the feedback and, and setting up your practices in such a way gives them way more ownership and understanding of, of what you're doing. Um, and then the last one I think that we'll go into. Can I ask a question about that principle right Absolutely, there? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, it's like two part question. So obviously you did that with the storm and it was very effective. And is that something that maybe you've brought to the Mavericks 
And if so, has it been as effective? I mean, I hate to say it this way, like, does it work better with women than it does with men? That that principle, or is that something that is receptive? Like, you know, the science shows it will work with both genders. It shows not even in sports. It, show, it, it shows it works in music. I'm using these techniques with my two-year-old daughter. Um, it's just learning. It's how our brains work. So it's a human thing. You know, uh, we are, we don't practice as much in the NBA. You know, we have yeah. so many games that we don't really have as much in, as much chance to compete and, and do some of this, but for sure, Rick and I have talked about it and, uh, and we definitely are implementing these. Rick was doing it a lot already. I think a lot of great coaches end up doing it uh, on their own because they're great coaches and they're great teachers and they've learned this is the most effective way of teaching. And it's more fun for your athletes. And, it, and like I said, it, this is what really creates an environment of the team taking ownership and not needing you as much because they've, they're learning this collective skill of, of problem solving together and communicating. So then you'll hear them, if you have this learning environment, you'll hear them in timeouts, like before you even get into the huddle, they're problem solving stuff. You'll see them on the court in the huddles, they're problem solving stuff, you know, and, and they're, they will solve a lot of stuff, you know, on their own, but even the video sessions, like we would break up into small groups and I would give them like short edits and they would have to figure out and give feedback without any coaches in the room, just to encourage that dialogue and that, that way of thinking instead of just being passive recipients all the time. You know, we would set up environments in practice where we do end of game situations and I wouldn't let any coaches be with the team. So what they would have to figure out if they were going to call a timeout or not. And if they did call it three, they had to play, figure out who was going to inbound it. They didn't, they didn't even know how hard this stuff was, you know, but they, they came up with some good stuff. And they also appreciated me a lot more after doing some stuff like this. You know, <laughs> another thing we used to do, it's kind of like a little bit, sounds a little crazy, but it really was effective, is we would set up drills with parameters that um, the more you can set up drills or situations or exercises where the feedback comes from intrinsic, so within the drill or situation, as opposed to your mouth, the better they're going to receive it and the better they're going to learn. So a dumb example, if you have a player that's shooting flat and you want them to shoot with more arch, as opposed to saying, hey, you, you know, it'll help if you put more arch on the shot. Just tell them, okay, I need you to make three in a row nothing but net. So giving them that parameter of shooting nothing but net will force them. They won't be able to hit it nothing but net without more arch, but it's the feedback is coming from within the drill and you're allowing their body to figure it out and feel it and fi figure it out on its own, as opposed to you giving them the feedback, if that makes sense. Yeah. So now they become more of a field shooter. They, in, and they're getting, they're going to receive it better when it's come from their own, the, the drill. Another example, we used to do a drill called the shot clock scrimmage, which I stole from a women's college coach. It's a great conditioner. It's a great way to work on your team, work with your team on, on playing fast and efficient. And it's a great way for your team to learn shot selection with you having to tell them that's a good shot for you, that's not a good shot for you, and then feeling boxed in. So you, you put three minutes on the clock, split them into two teams, five on five. And what you do is the parameters of the scoring system, but again, scoring how you score a drill or a situation is also gonna reinforce what you want without coming from your mouth. So in this drill, what you do is you put 24 seconds on the shot clock and you say, however many seconds are on the shot clock, when the ball goes in the basket, that's how many points you get. Okay, when the ball goes out of bounds, coach doesn't need to touch it, get in as quick as possible. If there's a foul, it's a, it's a score. However many seconds on the shot clock, that's how many points you get. So then it goes something like this. You got one team, they come down, kick it ahead, drive kick, baseline, corner three, 18 seconds on the shot clock, they get 18 points. Next team takes it out of bounds. They run down. They know they're down 18 already. So the point guard just pulls. 20 seconds on the shot clock. He's not a great shooter. Zero points. The other team comes down. They don't really get anything in transition, so they get to their secondary break, reverse it. Ball goes inside, inside out, drive it. Only nine seconds on the shot clock, but they score. So now they're 18 plus nine. The other team is now like, oh, crap. You know, so they kick it ahead quick. Quick three, 22 seconds on the shot clock, but they missed it. Zero points. You get the idea. 
by the end of it, the more you do it, you know, they start understanding and they start communicating amongst themselves as to what's a good shot, given the context, the player, the situation. And they start to get the idea of what is a great shot for our team based on who's on the floor with me and situation. The goal is to get the best shot within that possession, not just to jack up some shot by anybody. But my point is the feedback is coming from the drill and not me. And it's coming from within them, and it's way more effective. Okay, last one. There's a lot of examples of that principle, though, that I think is helpful, is most of us teach in our classrooms, in our, in our coaching sessions, we think repetition is the best way to learning. And so we teach in what's called block, block learning, block style. The best way to teach is proven to be randomized. So hitting a baseball is probably one of the most challenging athletic, athletic skills that there is. Most coaches, if they're training a guy to hit, they're going to give them 30 fastballs in a row. 30 fastballs. By the end of those 30, the guy's hitting it better. He's feeling good. Now we're going to do 30 curveballs. Throw, 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 throw. By the end of the 30 curveballs, he's gotten better. All right, cool. This is good. Now we're going to do 30 knuckleballs. Give him 30 knuckleballs. By the end of that block, he's gotten better at hitting the knuckleball. He walks out of practice. This was a great day. I got better. Coach is like, I'm a great coach. I'm going home. The other coach takes his athletes. He takes those three, same three pitches and he scrambles them. And the athlete is spraying it all over the place for all 90 pitches. He's banging his bat against the cage. The coach is like, what a shitty practice. Waste of time. But if you train that way, the athletes that trained in the scramble mode will blow the group out of the water that trained in, in block mode every single time. But the more, the more understanding the athlete and the coach has of this, then the more patience, obviously, they're, they're going to have. So again, I had to sell Sue on this. Sue doesn't like to turn it over one time. She is an OCD perfectionist, and she hates ugliness. And so I had to sell her on this, that if we train this way, you know, and it's within limits. And maybe day before a game was different. You know, I was pumping their confidence and we were doing things that were, they were going to succeed in. But we're going to be more effective at reads, playing faster, thinking faster, um, recovering from our mistakes faster than if we're, play, if we're training in the block style, which is going to feel a lot better, but is, is not going to be as effective in the game. If that makes sense. So we, we sold out to that. And like I said, I think, you know, Jonah was just mentioning it. Team didn't need me anymore by the time they were to year three, year four, uh, won a championship. And, uh, and really, you know, I think this, I'm sold more than ever in, in these teaching principles. So does that make sense? Is there anything you guys want to talk about when it comes to any of that stuff? Any questions with that? Coach, real quick, I had a question for, uh... As far as your teaching method, did you use it with your scouting reports at all, as far as like recall or to quiz them on it, like in the moment? Everything. We used it with everything. I mean, I just took these principles and I tried to use them with, with every possible aspect of teaching. You know, so it was way it, up, up front, it might have felt like it was taking longer. But then on the back end, like I said, I was way more necessary. Um, but yes, it's a great idea to use it with the scouts, you know, and, um, and have them before you even present, you know, if it's a team you've played before, okay, what, what's the identity, identity of this team and what are the keys to beating them? And let them start spouting up, out stuff. You know, like I said, even if they're wrong, if they start thinking that way, it's going to help. Another thing I did that I thought was really helpful and our players really liked it um, was, you know, at halftime, I don't know how it is on y'all's level, but – we have guys on social media, on their phones, like in their own head. Um, so what I did was I implemented this thing where, okay, you know, you guys know I'm going to be in in a few minutes. By the time I get in here, I want you guys to write on the board the two things we did well in that half and the two things that we need, areas of growth and things we need to do better in that half. So what ended up happening was instead of them going into the locker room and thinking about me benching them or how many shots they missed or – who, how many messages were on their phone and whatever they had to dialogue and like already start thinking, analyzing, like, okay, we did do this. Well, we got to keep doing that and we can do this better. 
And it was amazing how well, how really, how good they got at this to the point where there were a lot of half times I'd walk in and I'd look at the board and I'd see what they wrote. And I'm like, all right, you guys nailed it. Let's go. And I didn't even have to say anything, you know, because they were, they had analyzed things so well and were thinking, thinking like a coach, you know, and I thought that really helped us, um, you know, down the road. It, and uh, so that's something that I thought was, would I, I would adopt again. Yeah. I think with the feedback part, especially that what you said, um, studying a lot of volleyball coaches, feedback, garnering it from after games. I mean, I've seen some elaborate stuff, but um, I think as basketball coaches, sometimes we stay in our world of basketball and don't look for other places. So piggybacking on what you're saying, Jenny, we should be really getting with our volleyball coaches on the feedback that they get from their players and games in that format, along with that teaching method, they kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. I, I, Jonah mentioned it. You can learn so much from, from coaches of other sports and sometimes pick up some really good ideas, you know, as to how they're doing things. Cause we can, we can do things and continue to do things sometimes just cause it's always been done that way and not necessarily because it's, it's the best way. So I think it's always healthy to, to look and think outside the box and not be afraid to, to try some things if your instincts are telling you to. Jenny, can you explain a little bit more uh, the difference between the block style and scramble as it relates to maybe a particular skill you're trying to develop basketball wise? Yeah, like, I mean, there's, like I said, there's a million examples. Let's say you're, you're working with your athlete on pick and roll offense. And normally you would say, okay, all right, with your guards, you're doing a, a drill and you're working on pick and roll shots. And most of us would start with, okay, we're going to work. Uh, they're going under the screen. Okay. So we'll work on that shot where they're going under and we'll, we'll do that for five minutes. And then after that, we'll work, they're going over and we're going to work on whatever you teach, you know, the pull up, the floater, finishing at the rim, you know, but attacking. Um, and we'd spend five minutes on the first going under, five minutes on the, on the second going over. There might be a short period of time, especially with certain level of athletes, where you have to do a quick hit of like, okay, this is a reminder just to get your body reminded of what we're going to do against going under, what we're going to do against going over. But as quickly as possible, you want to get to a read where you have a defender out there and he can go or she can go over or under, and you add that read element. And, uh, and that's going to get them much more prepared, prepared for the game much more quickly than just working on it as a, in repetitions. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yep. yep that's Same great. thing defensively. You know, you're working on closeouts, you know, like, and you teach closing out short, you teach closing out long, you know, instead of doing like five minutes where you're closing out against a driver, five minutes closing out against a shooter, like scramble it, you know, and just, being able to read that, and if, and if you don't have the personnel to do it where you don't know offensively, like you're going to be a shooter, you're going to be a driver, like put a penny on the drivers and leave the penny off the shooters and just let, allow them to have that quick read because um, you're training their brain and their body for decision making and, uh, and also read and, and recognition. You know, like the greatest athletes like Wayne Gretzky, and you take Luca, like they're not the ones that would win a track meet. A lot of the time they're not, but there's something else that they have that's separating them. And a lot of it is this ability to read, anticipate, make decisions, think the game. Um, and I think we can train that, you know, training how to play more so than just robotic plays. And, and, and uh, you guys have already touched on that a lot, but you know, I was told my whole life that women don't know how to play. Like guys play pickup their whole life. But girls, you can't coach them that way. You have to tell them exactly what to do. They don't know how to play, so you have to coach them differently. And I was convinced that is untrue. And so my goal was to disprove that and train them and teach them from day one and put them in situations to learn and figure out how to play so that we would eventually be unscoutable because it wouldn't be about the plays. Yeah, I had my playbook. For sure, I had my playbook. But the, the beauty of that team was their ability to just play off of each other, play to their strengths, and bring out the strengths in each other. But that's what we were training, and that was the mentality of our team. I don't care how good your sets are. If you go against a good defensive team, your play after, and I forget what you said Pokey called it, 
Um, principles of play. The principles of play are way more important than your plays, you know, especially if you go against good teams, especially if you're making a deep playoff run. So whatever that, that those principles of play are, those, those should be, in my opinion, worked on way more than your sets. The sets are easy to work on. If you're a teacher, you can teach execution way quicker. It takes a lot longer to teach your team how to play together. Um, so I invested most of our time in the first layer of our teaching on that, on those principles of play. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Jenny, I know, I know you have to go soon. Um, so just give us, stay as long as you want. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm happy to, to answer questions with you guys. I, I do have an early morning and one more phone call to make. Um, but you know, if you guys have questions, I want to make sure that, that we get to them before I have to run here. Um, this yeah, stuff is really fun to play with. I'll tell you, it's really fun to play with some of these principles. Would you do that if you had a kid who, so I have, I'm a high school coach. So, and I have a young big who's a freshman and hasn't really played a lot. So I would do that like, okay, when someone goes under, this is what you do. You know, this is a get action, stuff like that. And we would do it in that block training style. Um, and he didn't progress maybe as fast as I thought he would because he's super athletic and he's big. W would you do that random with someone who maybe hasn't acquired the skill yet? Yeah, okay. I would. I'm definitely going to try it. Like, this is yeah. really – this is. But I'm telling you, it's ugly. Yeah, and it's ugly when we do it in block it, anyway. Like, you you know. have to know it's ugly. Yeah. But if you, if you study this and you understand that it will expedite the learning curve and it will make the learning go in way deeper – then you understand that it's worth it. And if they need a little love every now and then, you can, you can change the parameters to make it a little bit easier, like binary reads, which means only two reads are easier than three, obviously. Yeah. You know, so you can, you know, it's just the first teaching principle we talked about, which I know you guys already use. Like, we always want to have them just far enough outside of their comfort zone, but not too far out you know, where they just never get any feel or success. So we, that's our job as a coach is to try to be creative in our drills and our exercises and our scoring systems to try to keep them challenged, you know? Um, and, you know, it's way different. It was way different working with a rookie than it was Sue Bird training her to keep her stimulated and challenged. And I had to be very creative or I'd lose her. Um, and so, you know, the other thing with that is I had rookies and I had Sue, who's a four-time Olympian. Um, oftentimes, as coaches, we'll teach to the lowest common denominator. And the research shows, and I, and I really tried this, um, teach to the highest. And now maybe not if you have, like, one real outlier, but the higher tier of your team. Teach to them. That way you don't lose them. And it speeds up everybody else's process through that, that peer pressure and the example that's being set. And oftentimes reward will leave people behind. And so we slow down for the people that, that are tailing off and, it, and it, it just messes the whole group up. So teach to your highest tier and, and spend extra time if you need to with the people who are a little slower, but as a group, teach to your highest tier always. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. I think you mentioned earlier when you're coaching, uh, like you had some pillars of your team. I was just curious as to what. That's what? I think you mentioned like six pillars of a team. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, See, I was just curious as to what those were. Yeah. You're testing my memory. <laughs> All right. So um, passion was one. And, and these six pillars, by the way, uh, our, our GM, who she just said, tell me who you want, and I'll go get them. But I had, I had her understand that these were the pillars that I believe were championship culture. And so we were filtering all the players that we brought in through the draft, through free agency, through trades, through these pillars as well. So everybody was on board with this vision. Passion was the first one. I, I didn't want players that don't love to compete and love to play the game. I don't care how talented they are. And again, when you put these things on the wall and they're on the front of their notebook and you, die, and you declare these, these – uh, pillars now you're held accountable to them as well so if you bring in some somebody who's counter to these pillars your whole team's looking at you crazy so I think it's valuable to have 
pillars to what you want your culture to be. And also those need to align with your way of playing and your style of play. It all should tie in together. But so passion was one. And, and so all of our pillars were things that I disciplined and reinforced. These were like my things, you know, these were our things. And eventually, like I said, they became our things. But players who, who just were too cool, you know, who um, just didn't really love being in the gym, love competing, love playing, like they just weren't, they were not going to make our team, they were not going to be there. So passion. And it was rewarded when it was expressed. Because I'm a firm believer that the more your players feel the freedom to show their love for the game and the, that's contagious you know and i was in situations as the player and i've been in situations as a coach where we'd have these rookies come in with all this passion for the game and the vets would just like squash it like make fun of them and you know just down just make them feel terrible about it and they would lose it and it was just so sad you know to see that and it never it never went well it was it was never like a good thing but so i wanted that to be cool on our team to like have passion for competing so we we all wanted to be all about that passion resilience and that was mistake response you know really teaching mistake response and and reinforcing and disciplining that so if a player that wasn't good with their left, you know, we had a girl from Japan who was super athletic, could dunk off of a curl cut, and uh, but she couldn't go left and she couldn't use her left hand. So if she would even try going left, I didn't care if the ball went over the backboard, like she was going to get celebrated. And that was contagious on our team too, where everybody would celebrate her when she tried to do something that she wasn't good at, but they did it to each other too. And that helped our learning environment because people knew like, they were going to be encouraged for trying something that was maybe they weren't that good at, but that's how they were going to get better. You know, so mistake response, but discipline it as well. So if I had a player that missed a shot and put their head down on the way back up down the floor, they were coming out. That was to me mental weakness and resilience is like, no matter what happens, I'm coming right back at you and we're coming right back at you. So I wanted that to be our body language all the freaking time. No matter what just happened, we're right back at you, we're right back at you, we're right back at you. And that was something we emphasized a lot just on film and et cetera. Okay, humility um, was one. And the definition of humility for us was knowing unapologetically who you are and who you're not and being unapologetic about both. Um, you know, I think, in the men's level, a lot of guys think they're way better than they are. And on the women's level, you can't, you can't even get some of the best players in the WNBA to tell you in a group setting what their strengths are. And I wanted our players to feel free that if we went around the room and I said, okay, what do you bring to the table? Like, what's your thing? Like, they'd be able to say confidently, like, this is what I do. This is what I'm good at. Like, and they were, they were really good. And this is what I'm working on. And not be embarrassed about that. You know, so that was our definition of humility. Um, what ask not what your team can do for you, but what you can do for your team was another one of our mottos for humility. That's just a different mentality from today's players nowadays. Okay, um, let's see, what were the other ones? If I can't think of them, I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, I may have to get back to you guys. Humility, passion. Oh, unity, obviously. Um, servitude was the other one. So that was, you know, just having a mentality of how you're making other people about uh, around you better and how you're serving them. Uh, that's five. I don't know the sixth one right now. Sorry. I'll get it to Jonah. And I'll get back to you. I haven't thought about this in a while. There were five really good pillars. No. <laughs> there were five good pillars. There's one more that's really good, uh, but I can't think of it right now. And I will get back to you. I haven't been a head coach in a few years, and I've had a baby, and I've lost a lot of brain power. <laughs> well, you probably gained some. That actually that that leads me into a question I like to ask people that have been head coaches. Um, I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, and maybe it's harder to you don't have to go deep into it. But like, you're a head coach tomorrow. Team X, it doesn't matter what team. What are one or two things that maybe you learned from your previous experiences? And you can talk about like the difference from Sacramento to Seattle. I know it's a much different structured teams of veterans to rebuilding, but 
it seems like you you really embodied this approach and it, I would assume you would just do a very similar approach but maybe what's one or two things you would you would do differently or you've learned from being with Rick and down in Dallas or just what's maybe something you would adapt or change you know it's a good question um I mean, I thought what we did, like, honestly, was was on the right track. Some of our challenges we had, for example, we had, I think one of the things that was always a challenge for me is how involved do you get in your in your players' personal lives? Um, I took the, the route of you don't. Um, and then I ended up having, we ended up having a relationship between two starters that blew up the year that I got let go. And then I, and, and I had talked to Sue about it during the season, you know, is this something I need to step into? And she's like, no, just leave it alone. And then after things hit the fan, she said it was a lot worse than I thought you should have gotten involved. I'm like, thanks Sue. Um, but you know, like that's still, that's like a tricky thing, especially nowadays where, you know, different ages, different stages of life, like how much do you get involved in what's going on with them off the court? Uh, proactively or how much you just let them come to you when I was in Sacramento for whatever reason they all came about everything I knew everything that was going on I was helping them all with everything and then this thing happened in Seattle I was completely blindsided by it I had no idea it'd been going on three years but it blew up um, in year three so um, I think I'm still reevaluating that like I still don't know the answer to that but if I were to ever be a head coach again like trying to find that that line of when do you get involved with off court stuff? Um, and when, when do you not? Um, another thing I learned, I think the hard way through both of my experiences is, and I knew this, but I didn't, I just didn't do a good job with it is um, your staff, you know, like the importance of the loyalty of your staff and really knowing them I think because you don't really know people till you work with them or to somebody that you know really well that's going to tell you the truth knows them. And I had disloyalty issues like both in Sacramento and in um, in Seattle. And that I just now is like a deal breaker for me. Like, I don't care how much basketball, you know, I need to know that you've got my back and that that I can trust you. And I just don't know that I knew that it was as important as I do now. And so that's another takeaway. Um, I think also it's dangerous to hire people that are really ambitious to be a head coach or really bitter about not being a head coach because anytime they smell blood in the water or opportunity, then they're going to be the first one stabbing you in the back. And so that's another thing just with the staff that is tough because you want people who, who have aspirations, but that are, you know, you need people that are not also going to sacrifice you for that, if that makes sense. So those are, those are some things for sure that, that went wrong um, that I'd want to reevaluate. If it makes you, oh, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> Never mind. We had some similar situations. In yeah, it's it's no fun for anybody. No, it isn't. You know, it's no fun for anybody, but um, it's hard. You know, when I was in Sacramento, I mean, this is not to talk about that organization, but when I was a women's coach there, and I was young, I was 31 years old, the men went through like the Kings went through like four coaching staffs in the three years that I was there, maybe five. And one thing that stuck out to me was that the assistant coaches that were loyal to the head coach that got let go, those were the assistant coaches that got fired. And the assistant coaches that were disloyal to the head coach were the ones that stayed on. And I just thought, this is just such a screwed up world that we live in, you know, where disloyalty is, is rewarded at times, but um, it's the, it's what we sign up for. And I think that's where like the, the value of loyalty trumps, I think even X's and O's when you're putting a staff together. Hey, hey Jonah, I, I, I've got a comment along those lines. If, uh, if you've got time. I have all the time. I mean, you always have time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jonah, you know, we're, we're, we're in the NAI here at Roosevelt and, um, you know, I, th I think, I, I can't speak to the G League and the NBA, certainly, or even Division One. but uh, being in the small college realm, D3, NAI, uh, D2, as we are, you know, w once you become a head coach, I mean, we all coach. We all coach, ultimately, 
to become a head coach, whether we're coaching at a summer camp, whether we're an assistant at a junior college or a Division three or a high school or a Division two. We, most of our dreams revolve around as we, as we think about ourselves as coaches and we dream and we envision, we dream of how our team is going to be, you know, how our team is going to be when we're the head coach. I think once you become a head coach, I think it's incumbent upon you as a head coach to immediately figure out a philosophy and a pathway to empower those who are working for you to become those head coaches. You know, we all want to win games. We all want to talk about X's and O's and how do we win more games? How do we get to the conference championship? How do we win our league? How, do, how, can, we wait, how can we make the national championship? But in our philosophy, if, if you take care of your people, your players, your coaches, when you have everybody on board, that's going to maximize your chances of reaching your potential as a team and winning and getting to those ultimate destinations. So um, as a head coach, I think it's, I think it's, it's our responsibility to not just, not just try to win games and to keep our job going, but it's also to how can we, how can we get our assistants or the people who are on our staff closer to what their dreams are? Is it Adobo, a director of ops, trying to become a full-time assistant? Is it a full-time assistant trying to become that associate head or that head coach, that video coordinator trying to become a full-time guy? I think any coach who hasn't communicated that to his staff, you know, I, I guess I would like to know what, what, is, what, is, the, uh, what is the strategy, what, is the, what are the intentions, what is the motivation of the rest of your staff? Why are you coaching if you do if you do not want to be a head coach ultimately? And I think it's our duty and our responsibility, just like it would be to our players to graduate them and to maximize their potential as a player. I think it's almost it's almost um, identical to to maximize our, the, the staff and the people that are working with us, and not necessarily for us, but with us. So I thought. Um, with our last speakers, I, I, I thought everything has been great. Um, we need to expose and to educate and to examine and to almost, um, you know, throw them in the front lines with us of what we're dealing with. Here's our budget. Here's the emails that we're receiving. Here's the communication that we're receiving. How would you deal with this? What do you think we should do here? how do your values line up with what's going on right here? Um, so it was a great point of what Jenny talked about. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many head coaches are there being an NAI guy, you know, where I'm not an NBA coach or a G league coach, certainly, but uh, having the people alongside of you is, is, is a, is a huge part of our, our thoughts and our, our consideration and our tactics today certainly with the COVID pandemic and even regardless of COVID how do we get those people alongside of us alongside to uh to fulfill their dreams no I, I couldn't agree more but having been on both sides as head coach and assistant coach like after being a head coach and experiencing disloyalty the first time when I was assistant coach after that I even wanted to have a clause in my contract because I was in Seattle um, that if you fire the head coach, you have to fire me too. I'm not going to be the, hit the contingency plan because I wanted my head coach to know that I was there for him. If I was going to be a head coach again, it was going to be somewhere else, but it wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be the contingency plan um, and be put in that situation. And they wouldn't put the clause in my contract and I actually did end up taking over after him, but it was totally separate. And he's one of my best friends and it was a totally separate process. But I, that's how important I felt it was for the head coach to feel that, you know, the assistants were not there undermining him in any way, shape or form, if that makes sense. Yeah. It does, it's not mutually exclusive from empowering your staff and wanting them to be head coaches and being okay with them wanting to be a head coach. But loyalty should be, to me, it's, no, it's like mafia loyalty is number one on a staff. No matter what role I'm in or title I have, like it's not my goal to, to go get above and climb the ladder above anybody else on my staff. 
that goes for other assistants as well. Maybe, maybe one or two more questions for Jenny before she's got to go. Jonah, since you opened it up, it's not um, X's and O's, or, but it's, it's along the lines of what we just gotten into. I think it would be interesting for like a lot of people who have not been head coaches to see or hear from you when you were an assistant coach, what were some things you did to try to prepare yourself to be a head coach? Meaning like, I know you had your assistant coach responsibilities, but like the extra things are things that normally you don't hear people do. Were there one or two things that you did like head coach practice while you were an assistant coach? Yeah, the biggest difference, the, I mean, all you guys who are head coaches know this is the decision making, you know, like it's a huge difference between suggesting and deciding. And, um, and so, you know, you, practicing, I think, even in your own head, like not, not in a way that's undermining your head coach, but like what you would be doing in that situation all game long, what you'd be saying to the team in that timeout, what you'd be saying after the, the game. Um, and then thinking like thinking like a head coach before, during and after the game, basically. And yeah, you have your assistant coaching responsibilities, but I think the more you do that, the more you prepare for being in that seat of actually making uh, decisions. That's great, Jenny. You're welcome to come back anytime. We'll just give you the whole the whole the whole show. Um, no, I, I, Coach Z, I want your, uh, I want to see the X's and O's on the rest of your secondary break. That's, to me, living in the secondary is ideal, you know, like, because you're playing fast, but you still have organization. Defense never gets set, and, uh, but you still got good momentum going, getting into your stuff. So it's like my favorite phase of offense is that, that secondary transition phase. So I've already written down, like, a lot of your ideas. It's really, really really good stuff. I, I, I'm hoping I can get a copy from you of the, the other X's and O's. What, what I'll do is I'll send a, uh, to everyone on this list, I'll send an email, um, a, a video of the whole thing in each section, and then all the speakers that have materials will share what they want with me, and I'll send those out. Um, so that'll come out the next day or two, and okay. then you can steal all of Zach's stuff. Yeah, it's really good stuff. Perfect. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate, I appreciate it. It's been really an thanks, honor to Jenny. talk with you guys. And, um, you know, hopefully I can, like I said, get all this stuff and, and learn from you guys a lot as well because I can tell just the little that I've heard, you know, how bright you guys' minds are and how hungry you are to keep learning. So much respect. Thank thanks, you. Jenny. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Let's – uh. Let's finish with Zach, and then we'll take like a five-minute break, stretch it out, and then we'll finish up with Zach. Whoa, 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 whoa! When have we ever taken breaks before? We have once. We got well. That was yeah, we did. You're right. <laughs> that was a long day. I forgot about that. <laughs> We're practice random learning right now. Gotta be able to take a break and come back. I'm afraid if I stand up, I might fall over right now. Though my legs are dead, but that's okay. <laughs> All you, Zach. Uh, which Zach? You. Oh, okay. great, great. Give me one second. Or Hammer, if you want to, if you want to chime in and <laughs> give us something. Did you shoot a give low score one. today, Hammer? Did you shoot a low score today? I, I'm exhausted. I, I <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Chasing the ball. Said a word all night, though. <laughs> What's that? He hasn't said a word all night. Yeah. He said he was exhausted. He said he was exhausted. Yeah. I like the golf shirt there. Straight, straight from the course, you know. I like it, yeah. You need, you know, next time wear the Illinois golf team shirt, maybe that'll help you shoot the low score. How about that? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um. Hey, Zach, before you jump into it, can I ask you a question? Yeah, what do you got? Um, That's where, I like, guys, to be honest, guys, like, I want it to be, you know, as interactive as possible with their questions by, you know, fire away. I just wanted to – I agree 100 – I think – you tell me if I'm wrong. I, I think the most important thing about your offensive system is your vocabulary. 
because it builds upon, and like what you said, the kids, the kids can think it, they can think it through. So even if they're kind of, you know, didn't know what was going on, they know what the words, yeah. and they can put the whole thing together. I don't yeah. think enough, like how much time um, did you, did you, uh, like the words you were picking, were there, were there reasons behind it or just like, you know, it's simple, they can learn it, or how much time did you give to the thought of the vocabulary that you were going to use as you were building the system? Like so, so much. We tried to come up with like things that were catchy and sticky, and that's where like I, I again I give so much credit to the guys in the NBA because there's there there's so much there's so much they they put so much thought into that, and we try to put thought and like we we do like you know we we'll do naming contests, we'll do like we we try to do something that's sticky. Like I'm trying to think of. Uh, I'll give you – like, I'll, I'll try to come up with an example. Um, a fake handoff for us is called a car because we had a kid that flunked out three years ago named Bubba Car, and he loved to fake his handoff, so that became a car. And, like, everyone in the program knows what a car is, even guys that, like, didn't – I mean, Bubba's now been gone for three years. Um, so that kind of puts it into perspective. And so – but, you know – if you know, Tony, what it allows is uh, Bob Ritchie had a great point. You know, he spoke uh, at the NABC clinic. He talked about how language brings exclusivity in it, and so you can speak it. And so now, if we go uh, away, twirl hand, uh, away, twirl hand, you know, and Matt Wilson's like, hey, I'm going to car this one. Like, all of a sudden, everyone in the gym know on our team knows what's going on, and they don't. And there's brings an exclusivity where our guys say like, this is us and that's not us. And uh, I think that's worth something, but I also think it's worth something culturally, but even more importantly, I think it's worth something technically and just all being able to speak the same language. There's a, um, there's a language theorist. I took a, I took a bunch of language classes at Ford and there's a language theorist that says that you can't, you can't conceptualize an idea until you have a name for it. Um, and um, so essentially there are, there are feelings that the Germans have a name for um, that simply we can't, we would struggle for us to express them because we don't have a name for it. But as soon as you learn that name, you say, Oh, that makes sense. And I, shoot, I, there was one, I, I heard it two days ago. Jesse, shoot, which one Je was Jesse's coming to, to us from Germany. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of really big words here uh, that, it's like a whole sentence for us. <laughs> um, can you, can you there's, a really, there's a really good one. I heard it two days ago. Yeah. Um, but this, so my point is, so there's a whole theory of language that if you don't have a name for it, you can't conceptualize that idea. So, again, it's, a, you know, have kooky names. As long as it's, you know, if, as, as corny as it is, if it sticks, you know, your guys will love it. So, uh, Tom, I agree with you. Zach, quick question for you about yeah. kind of your identity that you built into the team because, honestly, we fucking hated playing you guys when you played so fast. Like, it was a bitch to defend, just constantly have to worry about it. Did you have to convince the players, like, hey, this isn't going to work. We're switching it. Like, how did you guys handle, like, switching what your identity was to something new? Um, well, one thing was, was we were as fast as <clears> – <throat> We're as fast as ever off of uh, make off of misses, and so that wasn't changing. And we spent just as much time on it, so it wasn't going to change. And our our pace slowed a little bit off makes. Um, our goal was for it to not to, um, but it did end up slowing a little bit. But our, our talk, a lot of it was, we're going to run and we're going to spend the floor just as much as we were before we're just looking to organize into action quicker. And so we almost looked at it as like, hey, we're trying to play at the same pace, but now, you know, we're going to try to be smart with it as well. Hey, we're playing fast. We're playing hard before. Can we add that smart element to it? That was the pitch we made to them. Um, and frankly, Jimmy, there was a, something working for us in that we hadn't been efficient with it. So there was a little bit that we could tell them that, It'd be a little bit harder if we had been a little bit better in that area, but we had said, "Hey, we're not doing enough to win the league right now." Um, and ultimately, our defense slipped a little bit because our offense, 
you know, Jimmy, you've been in the league with it. Like, I think you need to be top four in both to have a chance. And uh, ultimately, our offense got to where it needed to. Unfortunately, our defense, you know, slipped in the same year a little bit. But, uh, you know, that was the point a little bit was, hey, we're going to run. We're going to play with the same pace, but we're going to just do it and be, a, be in a more organized fashion. Any other questions before I get going on this other stuff? So we were always in that spacing. We're always in that five, five, taking the ball out, getting it out for opposite. But at any point, if our point guard didn't like the spacing or if he just wanted a drag, again, best guard in the league, he just wanted a drag, he could call push or, Det push or Detroit. So Detroit was the double drag. Push was just an empty drag that he could come in, that he could run into. And again, this was uh, – this is kind of that same – this is the concept I was talking about with De'Aaron Fox. We saw this from De'Aaron Fox. De'Aaron Fox thing does this better than anyone in the league, where especially when you have this empty drag, you have that whole court to play. And we tr really try to get him like, hey, you're playing one-on-one -on, -one on that whole court. And like here, like they end up cutting him off, and now we go into that deep pick and roll. And this is like really funny too because you look at guys that have played four years together. I mean, Jimmy will tell you, these guys probably – I mean, pr practice included, I'm saying 2,000 pick and rolls, even probably even more than that. And they're having conversations like during the possession, like watch this, inter watch this interaction. Like he's telling them to come, they're bitching at each other and Funk gets away. And there's just something to that ball going so low on that baseline. And we got great stuff this year on low angle pick and rolls. And we'll get to it in a little bit. One thing that's great about low angle pick and rolls is they are really hard to ice because that is a long way for that big to go on those low-angle pick-and-rolls. So we actually had a whole series that we would go to if we played an icing team. Zach, a lot, of, a, a lot of NBA teams call that logo, or like logo yeah. action. And yeah. Westbrook is another, like, he's bigger than Fox, obviously. Yeah. So you can get to that back down. And then if he doesn't have, like, that one down – um, that big can come and, and get to the same action. But, yeah. It's so good. It's so good. You see it right here. He doesn't – you know, he gets held up a little bit on it. It's so good. One thing is, I'll, I'll say this, the logo's good, but a low angle one of just setting that ball screen all the way in the corner, you'll see it on when we run salt. Um, and that's another one. that uh, When you're running single drags, this is – he was great at spotting this where that guard's sending him to a drag and that drag's not there yet. And I'm, I'm sorry, that like that, yeah, that drag's not there yet. And just being able to knife through that early, that's an early split. There's a guard in our league, Jordan Burns, who was at Colgate, phenomenal player. He did it. And it's really cool that when – one thing, guys, is and this is an aside, watch great players in your league. You'll learn so much from them. You'll learn so much in player development. You learn them doing like small stuff. So that early split, and we call this a Jordan Burns, of just this early split on a ball screen. Burns would get a little bit later than that. I stole that from Jordan Burns and being Funk ended up, you know, taking that this year. Um Zach, did you guys did you guys ever tilt the ball screen? What do you like, mean by tilt? Like like angle it where his shoulders were sort of like at an eight, like at a I don't know what kind of angle it is, but like not a not shoulders to the sideline, but shoulders sort of towards the middle of the, middle of the court scoreboard. I know Butler yeah, you know what? Well, I, I should have shown him we would, we would, especially in the in the in the double action in our Detroit action, especially if they're going under. We, what we would do is we'd go and we'd set that second one dangerously low. Because yeah. one thing, especially with unders, is one thing they won't do at a certain point. If you set a low, if you set a ball screen and you set it low enough. At some point, the defense is just going to go over the top, even if they're trying to go mm -hmm. under it. But one thing is, if you set that first one at a normal height, and then it is really hard for the, that guy to go under one, then over the second one. So it's funny. We would set that – we would come down in Detroit. Let me see if I can find one. I, I had it pulled up because uh, I think this will make a little bit of sense. Where are this? You don't see it really right there, but like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, look at the their NJIT is trying to go under this stuff, and like, look at the angle we're trying to set this at. Yeah. Look at it. I mean, we're we're at the free throw line, and now it just he gets downhill. 
But Butler um, did a bunch with Sean McDermott as like the second screener, and they just slip him out, like sort of like the same concept you guys did with Grayson. It was just so low at the elbow, like so hard to guard. Um. So push, we're pushing that guy through because we're opening up that corner. For us, a Princeton concept side ball screen with a screen off the alley. This is really hard to guard. Is one thing that ends up happening a lot is you just end up like here. And it's just really bad defense right here. Oftentimes what will happen is it, anyone running prints and actually will tell you this, this screen on the left elbow oftentimes will pull both those guys out. And what you'll get is you'll get the roller wide open here. That's just awful defense. And we end up, uh, we end up getting the three. So good recognition by our guy to screen his own man there. but this is pushed to an alley screen. That's what you'll get a ton is you'll get that roll man open. That will open it up. Push Indy. Again, you see this right here, kind of how it works. I'm there at the front of the bench calling that out. And now push Indy for us is just a double. So anything we run that's a double screen is an Indy screen for us. It's an, you know, and again, Tommy, going back to your term, your, your point about terminology, um, terrible technical foul call um, is that was, you know, running double screens for white Indiana shooters. We call it an Indy. Um, again, double screen. Same concept we had before. Again, mesh, push mesh. We love this against switching. Bucknell tried switching one through five at times this year. So they switch one through five. We come, it looks like we're playing weak side of the floor to ball screen motion. Come here, fake the handoff, throw it right in against the switch. You can run that against switching or regular. Again, our guys understand that concept of mesh. So we can run Dallas mesh. We can run push mesh. We can be in flow. And if we call mesh, we know we're getting to that fake handoff option with a five-man coming underneath. Philly, as we put our four-man in there, and we pop them. Philly for us is a is a call pop. One thing we like on pops is throwing backs great, but we also like just baiting that five man to leave early by looking at the looking at the pops. This is a great job by Funk. We'll work on this a ton of just looking back to that pop guy. He leaves early, and it's why pick and pops the five men are literally that's the cheat code in basketball. If you can do that, it, there's no way to guard it. Because now all of a sudden that big's worried and he gets back. Push wheel is just us running the guy through from the weak side. Some teams play some different ways in our league where they have a heavy uh, help guy on the roll. And so we'll try to distort that by bringing that guy around in that situation. This series we'd run exclusively against teams that iced. This is a salt. So, again, Tom, salt, defraud, defaws, ice. That's said by a native Mainer who knows, how, you know, how you eliminate ice. Uh, so salt for us. Obviously, it could have been run easier. Again, that low angle ball screen is really hard to ice. This is a better example of it. Dribble handoff. We want to sell that we're coming off this ball screen. And now he passes. He floats over the top. And now it's just really hard to ice that thing and keep that thing down on that ice because that big's nowhere to be found. Snap, sold this from the Boston Celtics, just hitting, coming to play behind. Pat, to answer your question on this one, we actually wanted him to go under this first one because it would set up this uh, rescreen. We call it a pancake because we're flipping that. We're flipping that pancake. And so we actually would on purpose set this where they would go under it so we could, we could pancake it back. Like I like that. That's nice. Snap flip. This play was really good to us. We distort some personnel at times. We'd also run this after free throws where we'd switch our point guard and our shooting guard. And uh, this is a play. Uh, I think this is the highest points per possession play in the NBA. Uh, the Denver Nuggets run this. I mean, they, this, you know, again, that's completely no statistical backing. This is my feeling on this is the this is a Denver Nuggets play. So for us, snap is hitting to the five and just playing. Snap flip is running the four through. 
hands back to the one, and now we come right off that. We love to slip that. We'll slip that for the screener, or we'll also slip that. A slip is a great way to get a driver downhill, particularly a guy that might not be great with the basketball. So we'll either come off that or we'll slip it. Any play call for us that ends in blue means it's a slip. So snap, flip, blue tells Wilson he's slipping this. I think he sets this one. Now he slips it. I should have. I was right. Slips are great ways for guys that aren't don't have a great handle. This was a really. This was one of our best plays to us for us. That's a design slip. This is just same play, and he just keeps it coming off this. Defense falling asleep. This play was really good to us. Looks like uh, that's bad execution. This will be better execution. Snap rip. So it looks like snap. It looks like he's coming for the handoff. He actually comes underneath him. Pat, you and I were talking about inverting some ball screens, 5-1 ball screens. I wish we had done it right here. I wish yeah. that's like something we had in our package right there. Fortunately, we didn't get to it this year. Pat and I had a good conversation and like about just finding ways to – run some 5-1, and my point is any time at all in your offense where any dribble handoff in your offense can essentially – the counter can be simply one setting that ball screen for, for five. So I'm mad we never got to this, but this was a really – this was a good set play for us. This was snap rip. We're coming down. We're in snap. It looks like snap. But instead of the handoff, he's actually coming underneath them, firing up. We're hitting that guy right there. Did, did team show us – I know you and I know you showed earlier that – after Funk would set that like rip screen and then get the ball back, the team just switched that one through four or what? Like, what did you guys get out of that? Um, team, some teams non-switch? would sw- some teams would switch a one through four, and so you know, in that we'd go into our switching attack. Um, I, I wish I, I wish I'd kept the clip on um, against BU. BU try to switch one through four, and we like the space. We like the space uh, that four, and then. What we really like, again, switching is we really love driving the ball back in terms yeah. of driving it. If we came off a ball screen um, to our right hand against the switch, we like to pop that guy and then bring it quickly back to my left hand. So I'm coming off that ball screen to my right hand, and now I'm coming back to my left hand to attack that gap and, tra- and see if I can get downhill. Um, no one in the country does that better than Northwest Missouri State. Yep. Northwest Missouri State was the number one D, uh, D2 team in the country, and uh, I broke their stuff down this offseason, and it's it's brilliant. And to be honest, it's not very schematic. Um, I actually think they play more like an NBA team than anyone in the country. Um, they're the best cutting team, and they're the best ghosting team I've seen, and they're really good attacking switches. And the best thing they do against switches is that drive it back concept, and that's the concept we were good at, Northwest Missouri State was great at. I broke that stuff down, so if anyone wants that, I'd be more than willing to share that. Your point guard's nasty. Oh, my God. He can play for anyone in the country. Um, so, snap rifle. Rifle for us is a wide pin down. And going to set that wide pin down. Just getting some off-ball action. Wedge for us. Wedge can be into a ball screen or a post up. It's completely 14's call in his read. Um, the way we tried to do it for him was on that wedge screen. So this is ball side wing coming to set. He should hold that timing a little bit more. But what we said is if that defender is trailing, we want to go to the block. If that defender shoots the gap and runs the block, we want to go set the ball screen. Or if he jumps and tries to chest them on the on the cut, we want to go set that ball screen because essentially we want to go away from wherever he's going. Lose these AirPods a little bit. Can you guys hear me? Yep. 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 All right. Um, so if he went down to the block, we'd go set a ball screen. If he was trailing me, I'd go down to the block. If he jumped and tried to get in front of him, like trying to beat the cut over the top, we would just try to walk him in because essentially if we can screen him and that guard defender, now we're setting a double screen. Good split. This is wedge action. San Antonio Spurs has been running forever. We would set this flare at times. Uh, we 
get a good flare. We would set this flare for that guy. No, I thought we had one right here. And then wedge down, again, two balls, two screens. He sets a ball, he sets a ball screen, then he sets a down screen. There he forgets, <laughs> remembers at the last minute. So that's our series. Um, and again, that was kind of our thinking was, um, was being in the same alignment, playing with good thrust, good pace early on the clock, and getting to actions, getting organized, and getting to actions as, as soon as we could or as early in the shot clock as we could. Zach, I got a question for you. Um, obviously, I guess, so you guys were still top 15 or so in the country in offensive possession length um, this year. And then you, you ran a lot of stuff, obviously. Um, I guess my question is how, how did that work? I know that Jonah, we've we've talked about it. George Carl's thing that he said to to Quinn, right? You can, you can you can play fast or you can can run plays. Basically, I think I'm paraphrasing. Um, and it seems like you guys were able to accomplish yeah. both at a pretty high level. So I guess I, I, I'm I'm just curious how how you guys did that. Yeah, and, and so I think there are two things. One is I think sometimes as coaches. Or and this was my takeaway this year. If you were asking me, this was my biggest takeaways is I really think there can be a difference between how you play off makes and how you play off misses. Um, the other thing I would say is this is I, I really think it speaks a little bit to what Jenny was saying, and it's funny, she kind of just left with this comment. And I thought it was really good. Like I, I really think there's something too secondary. Because, I mean, the, just the this, this timing which we, we're getting into these actions, I mean, we're getting into these actions at 26 and 20, and they're also not complicated actions. So I really think there is something to secondary because I think it's this, like, great medium between sets and, but while also playing with pace in that the actions aren't that hard to guard, but it just if the defense is guarding them at 26, four seconds of the shot clock, it's hard. Um, so that is one, I would say that's where some of it goes. The other thing I would say is this too, is that we were, we were also still very fast on misses. So that, I think those two things together, um, I think made, made up for that. Um, but I really, I'll tell you, I'm a huge fan of secondary because I just, I think it allows you as a coach to manipulate and organize in, in organize action, organize your offense possessions early. Ooh. Zach, just to chime in on that, and Zach, Zach Hamer, we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, Mike Leach, what you were talking about, having a lot of families or just a lot of options. And one thing, like, I think back to, I guess it was two summer leagues ago now, and a lot of teams in summer league, and it's summer league, like, it's my Super Bowl, but most people don't care about it. Um most teams put in three or four plays and, and that's it. And like we kept adding plays and we thought it it hel helped engage our team and kept guys mentally, you know, activated. And like I know the Warriors a couple of years ago when they were really good, like when they were just starting to be good, they would put in almost a new play every day, which again, maybe doesn't quite answer your question, but I do think that you have to read your team at how mentally, you know, how much mental capacity they have to run a play. Um, because sometimes, and again, I, I know I said all, all the stuff earlier, but it's just a fine line. And like, I think sometimes we just say, guys can't remember that. And it's like, we'll try and see, you know, each, te each team you have is a little different in that sense. Hey, Jonah, to, to add to that, I think I love the word that you use with activation. Because the way our league was set up, when I, when I was at Bates, it was like a football league. We played on the weekends. So we, we could, you know, we had all week. I mean, what, what are we going to do? We, we just could do stuff. So in, in conjunction with having the vocabulary system and then adding a couple of things, when, you, when we added stuff, 
you know, it, it, it stuck. Like, I like how Zach says it was sticky, you know, and they could process it through because we had vocabulary. Engaged throughout, it kept them engaged throughout the whole, I think my internet went out again. I'm sorry, I'm in the mountains, but it kept them engaged throughout. And quite frankly, like, you know, then a team would be scouting us all week and we come out with like what they would think, you know, like, what are you running? You're running a whole new thing. And it was, it was really the same thing for us. We just added a, an action out of a formation, you know? Zach, that's a question for, for you. Like, I know this was more just your secondary stuff, but like if you're ATO or after free throw packages, we're yeah. a lot out of this. I mean, I didn't watch you guys at all this year. Uh, some of them were. So yeah. for us, again, I, I think there's three distinct. If you're talking offensively, there's three areas. And then there's really a fourth. And that there's off makes, there's off misses, and there's your sets. And then I think there's a big fourth in that. It's your play after the play. It's all right, what, what, what happens after you break it all down? But I – so I, I think you need to have a clear idea of how you want to play in each one of those all four of those areas and um, some of our sets would come out of stuff like this. Um, but then we had some just, you know, we had just our ATOs uh, package as well. We had our Ivan, Iverson series, we had our Horn series. We had, you know, we had our different series, but sometimes what would happen a little bit to, and this might get to what you're saying is like our guys grew so comfortable with this stuff that they'd kind of be like, Hey, let's run, let's start running some more of that stuff. Just, off deads and off free throws um and that that happened that happened like uh, you know that kind of was natural that guys just grow comfortable with it hey army zach um when you oh man i just forgot what i was going to say that's what happens when you start getting old man i'll remember it i'll get back to you in a second one thing along, hey. oh, 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 yeah along that point too a little bit was then the year two is as you practice less like can you spend time and can you try to steal some points by beefing up your sideline out packages, beefing up your baseline out packages. I'm really talking here with the college guys in the room. Like if you're practicing 30 to 45 minutes less than you were during, you know, at the beginning of the year, I'm not saying keep them for 45 minutes of baseline out stuff, but like can you start to try to steal some points and start maybe extending your walk and talks during that point of the year while if you're cutting down in practice? That's just something I thought of when you guys were talking about adding plays. And at the end of the year, that's something we're going to be much more aggressive next year with. Hey, a um, couple of questions. One, um, I saw a couple of times, whether it be a baseline drive or using a ball screen, like you guys would cut the top, um, like the top of the tandem side, the weak side. Yeah. Was that intentional or is that you, like you have a guy, you know, you said one guy was a better cutter than he was shooter. Is that something you guys? Yeah. Like? So what we, what we try to do, uh, what we try to do is we try to fill uh, that opposite corner. And then yeah. we really try to get aggressive with that. We call it a D Wade cut. The next guy is, is diving to the rim. Um, gets a little bit clogged there, but it's funny. Those two guys end up figuring it out a little bit in terms of the big getting to the front of the rim but also you have that cut, you have that D-Wade cutter coming down. Well, yeah. The thing I said, Zach, the thing I said with it is, like, the kid Funk was one of the five best passers in the country. I'm telling you, he's brilliant. And, like, that being said, the amount of times, like, in three years where, like, we filled corner and we filled, we, we filled drift and we filled window, the amount of times he threw it to the guy in the window, I mean, just a handful. So our thinking was, like, mm. if we're always filling that guy, like, and we're never throwing it there – you know, is he does he is he better to cut that guy in there? And we end up getting a lot out of the cut. And I'll I'll say him again. There's no one in the country that does that better than Northwest Missouri State. They, you know, yep. them diving that guy to the to the front of the rim on a baseline drive. They're unbelievable with it. But that was one, that. Just a, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, was that a standard concept or was that personnel dependent? That was like, standard yeah. concept. Any anyone was going there. Uh, we always filled corner, and the next guy was going to die for us. He wasn't filling to the window. Okay, cool. One or two more questions? Uh, I just wanted to – Zach said something that was uh, interesting there where he's talking about getting into something at, at 26 on the shot clock, and this is something – I can't speak to how it, how it necessarily works at the college shot clock, but at the NBA level – uh, you can see that it's uh, worth basically 
even out, out taking the ball out of bounds when you're going to play a little slower, it's worth a full point of offensive rating, one point per 100 possession, just to get into something a second earlier, just to make the defense play. Uh, the Spurs are, have always been a team that hasn't played super fast in terms of shooting early, but they get into stuff earlier. And you can see the effect of that, even off of dead ball situations. Um, and, and I think that's uh, it's just something from a – you can empirically see it that it's something that is good for your offense just to get into something, even if you're not getting a quick shot off of it early. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that stuff. That's, that's something I felt intuitively and that's back and that's cool to see that the numbers are, you know, back that up a bit. I'm not crazy. I was like, no, no, no. Hey Zach, quick question. Uh, how fast do you want to push on makes? Knowing that teams are back, I know you mentioned obviously in your league teams are back getting set up, but you want to flow into what you want to flow to with pace. Are you ever trying to just get that ball up as quick as possible, like Michigan State type thing, or what do you just talk about that real quick? Yeah, you know we 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 w there would be times when we did because we would play with enough pace that we'd get a free one, we get a cheap one, in which we'd never take. We never we call that a siren of just you know we're, we're pushing and we're just running. We're playing with great pace. Um, the thing we would say there is we wanted paint touches. We didn't really want pitch aheads unless we, there was only one guy that was going to shoot a pitch ahead one in that situation. Everyone else was going to be drive to the paint and move it. Um, and it would happen at times. The, the word we used off of makes was thrust. We wanted to play with thrust. We wanted to arrive with an advantage we wanted to we wanted to get the play where we arrived in that with in our to our action with the defense on their heels and play with thrust and the, we had that in big letters in, in our locker room. Uh, that was the word we used. Um, I would say we talked on makes. We talked about um, we it was same concept of your sprint in your lanes. We talked about winning your winning the race to half court with our wings, um, and then we talked about thrust arrive with an advantage. Um, and just get to actions early in the clock. Um, and there were times when we'd get something cheap. We, like I would say, no, well, once a game, yeah, maybe once a game, we'd get something cheap. We'd where our pace was just good enough that we'd get something, we'd throw it ahead, and we'd attack. Um, so you know, that, that was just kind of the natural habits that were built. Out <laughs> Hey, and with that, what about, like, the calls you made when you were saying, you know, as it's coming up to court, was that ever hard to communicate um, to everyone, or is that never really an issue? Only Nova. Only Vir Villanova was hard. Um, now, you guys playing more of those kind of atmospheres. It's funny. It was something I was petrified about going into the year, and it's, it's funny. Our, it, it really – and I could feel myself getting better at it. I was the one making those calls. And I could feel myself getting better at it um, as it went. As you, and my point is, I hope it makes sense. But, like, as that ball was coming up, like, one of our guys – and it's so funny how you start to intuitively feel this. Like, Josh Caldwell can't dribble with his left hand. Lonnie Grayson can't dribble with his right. Like, and you'd start to, like, think for a second. Be like, all right, the next time we have a right push, we're going to go snap, flip, blue. We're going to try to get Josh Caldwell downhill to his right hand. Um, the next time – we, we have a left side push. Let's go wedge down to try to get Tucker Blackwell coming around the other side. So um, it always worked. Now, we don't have great attendance in the Patriot League, so maybe that contributed to it. But um, the other thing, too, is with senior point guard, Funk could start being able to call his own if he, if he really wanted to. And if he felt something, he would just call it. And that ball's going to the net, and he's just calling, you know, hey, hey, you know, Michigan, Michigan, you know. So that, that was another thing that happened. But – only one game we had trouble with it. And it was also the first game of the year. I actually think we could have handled it if it just wasn't the first game of the year. I really would say – one thing I would say is this, is I really think it is um, – I got the idea from Josh Shirts about calling and being a little bit more complicated off makes and still being able to play with pace. And he's like, do it, try it, you can do it. That's one thing I would recommend is I really think if you have organized spacing, you can get to actions quickly off makes off a coach's call. And Josh Shirts is the head coach of Lincoln Memorial. And he was the one to really pound that in. He's like, you can still play fast. You can still play with good pace on makes and still call your plays.
Thanks, Zach. Hey, one other thing just on misses. Do you like, in general, one through four being completely interchangeable, NBA-like, sometimes obviously one through five in the NBA? Or do you like the old school, I'm not saying this is what you guys did, the old school secondary break alignment? Um, do you feel like there should just be complete freedom one through four? Um. I just think, I think that middle of the floor needs it one it, I think it depends on personnel. So um if you're for, I, I think the first question you ask is how many people can push? Um how many how many people can push? And that I think that's the first question with makes. Um I think ha, then you're talk about your habits in terms of you sprinting the floor because if you don't have great habits sprinting the floor, nothing else matters. Um and then I think the next one is like, what does your four do? Is he a guy that can catch the ball and play and be a playmaker? Or is he a guy that is best running to the rim? And now it's like, hey, whichever big is first, run him to the rim, next one trails. I ultimately, uh, we've had a ton of success, one through four being, uh, being positionless, but us trying to funnel the ball through the one. So I shouldn't say we're positionless. We're actually positionless two through four of just running wide and playing to the rail, playing on the rails, run, filling the corners in the 45 and just opening up that floor as much as we can to the point guard and encouraging the point guard to look early opposite on pitch aheads. But also if he can't do that, to dribble probe and try to get a piece of paint, uh, try to draw a piece of the paint or draw help and move it. And the five man is kind of is reading the situation. If he's ahead, he can run to the rim and be ahead. If he's even, he can drag ball screen. If he's behind, he stays behind on the play because he's the link to the next phase of our offense. And sometimes the most important thing for him is he just needs to hold up and let that break happen. Nothing happens, comes back to him. All right, now he's going to link us to the next phase. Zach, that's, that's really good stuff. Um, thank you. You know, I'll make sure everyone gets whatever. Um, yeah. A I can, I, any, any of that video, any of the diagrams anyone needs, I can get out to anyone. Hey, uh, Zach, I got one. Army Zach, I got one last question. We need we need the website back up, man. I know. I got we I got the website back up, man. I got I got, I got a fourteen hundred dollar uh, maintenance fee. I got I got to pay, so someone's got to sponsor it. Hey, well, don't ask Bobby for money. I see you later. <laughs> I got bills to pay, man. <laughs> yeah, TV, you're your connections, bro. You, you broke is, up I'm, a little I'm bit. Done. <laughs> <laughs> You've been trying to get some C3 donations for the last hey, two man, months. It, it, it cut off the professional development budget at Williams. What do you want me to tell you? You know, <laughs> been saying that since before the pandemic. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> man, I was on my six month period, man. I can't get. I got to get to the six month period first. You know. <laughs> Good deal. Well. Thanks, Zach. Do you guys want to take a quick break, or do you want to you want to power through? Hey, how about this? If 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 Phil's then got his mom a good Mother's Day gift, it could be it could be his call. How about that? We have to see if he got a good enough gift, though. Uh, what's so, after? I uh, I brave. I'm gonna speak for myself here. <laughs> I uh, I braved the coronavirus to drive from Wisconsin to Minnesota to bring my my daughter to hang out with her. So. Oh, okay. I'm gonna okay. Do yes. my own horn. <laughs> okay. It's your call. It's your call. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. It's up to Tammy, you Tammy, do you concur with that? He, he wouldn't lie about that. <laughs> You're on mute, Mom. My granddaughter is here. So, yes, I would say I have to. <laughs> Zach, it's your call. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Do you guys feel like you need a little break or do you want to get going? I know it's getting late. Let's get going. Kirsch, you got the intro, uh, man. We'll, pow we'll power through. Um, so I'll just say a couple words about, about Zach. Uh, he mentioned this earlier. He's in his second year as a head coach at uh, Lawrence University, Division three school, Appleton, Wisconsin. Before that, he spent three years as a head coach at Lancaster Bible College in Pennsylvania. Um, he kind of mentioned this earlier, but I think at the time he was named the head coach at LBC. If he wasn't the youngest head coach in the country, he was definitely one of the youngest. Um, 
and I haven't looked this up, but I'm pretty sure that he owns some sort of record for uh, the longest undefeated or unbeaten streak for any first year head coach. Uh, Cause in his first year at LBC, they didn't lose their first game till the NCAA tournament that year. And uh, so if it's, if it's, if it's not, it's gotta be a record of some sort, Zach. Um, one of, one of many that you, that you either have or, or will continue to, to have. Um, but, you know, for me, Zach, I think other people have alluded to this, you know, I think Zach really represents, he's a terrific representation of what C3 is all about. Uh, he's one of my closest confidants in coaching. And he's somebody who I consistently, you know, bounce ideas off of and who I trust a great deal. Um, in my opinion, Zach has all the qualities you'd look for in both a head or assistant coach at essentially any level. Uh, he's really driven, extremely driven, uh, curious, disciplined, persistent, fi and finding and applying uh, solutions to both basketball and life. And about the only knock I can, I can, uh, I can give on him is that he, he dabbles in a little zone from time to time. And <laughs> he actually almost convinced me last year that we should play some zone, which he was actually probably right about. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but tonight's all about offense. Zach's an outstanding offensive coach, very bright mind, and, and uh, excited to have what you have, so, to, to hear what you have. So it's, it's all yours, Zach. <clears throat> Appreciate it, man. Thank you. So, like I mentioned this earlier, um, when I was at LBC, we kind of dabbled with a lot of different stuff, um, tried some different things. And first year, I mean, we had great athletes that took over a pretty good team that just was about getting over the hump. And we were able to add a couple pieces after I got the job there and just played really fast. I mean, we, we just went and we played fast. We just kind of spread people out, four out, five out. Um, <clears throat> after that, we, we kind of had to start over, graduated a bunch, had, had to have a few guys move on um, for some disciplinary reasons and <clears throat> kind of dove into um, some ball screen stuff with the next group and kind of start from scratch and we're able to kind of piece things together and made the conference championship. And then the following year, we were able to add a few good pieces and, and make another run and, and get in the NSA tournament again. Um, and that year, it was kind of more like the first where we kind of played fast and, and really spread people out and um, some dribble drive contests, whether it be out of four out or, or five out. But when I was there, um, one of my players is cousins with Lenny Acuff. And uh, he kind of introduced me to some of his stuff. So I started to get intrigued with, with some of the Prince's stuff. Prince's stuff was with pace. And we dabbled in a little bit of chin stuff. But we just didn't, we just didn't have the right personnel yet um, at, at LBC to really um, – go full force into it. So I got the job here at Lawrence, um, very different type of school, high academics, smarter kids, and thought this could be a pretty, pretty good option. So um, that summer going into to Lawrence, I kind of dove into the Princeton stuff, dove into Lenny's stuff, dove into um, Dale Wellman, Nebraska Wesleyan. They had won the national championship division three that year, run some really good Princeton stuff, very positionless in it. Um, dove into some of William and Mary when Tony Shaver was there, um, kind of fast paced, free flowing stuff. And really fell in love with it. And to the point now where I'm a big fan, it's, it's been really good for us these first couple of years. Um, offensively, we've been, we've been pretty good. we got to figure out that defensive stuff, which is why we've, we've kind of experienced or played around with some different stuff. But offensively, we've been pretty good doing, doing some of this stuff. And I've really tried to just blend concepts from, from those guys, from, from Lenny, from um, who is some of you may know is an absolute genius uh, offensively, one of the best offensive coaches in, in the country um, who, who I've gotten to know a little bit. So um, he's been huge for me uh, as, a, as has Dale Wellman. So um, some offensive like philosophy thoughts, which kind of play into this before I dive into some of the concepts and then, then I'll let you all like ask some questions and we'll go from there. The first one is um, – my mom being a coach, it was really pounded into me at a young age, the purity of the game. So passing, cutting, screening, ball movement, um, stuff that, that I'm a big fan of. Um, I, I want basketball to be played in my mind the right way with a lot of those um, fundamental details and disciplines. Um, so our stuff at times, this is one of the things Lenny told me, like when you do this right, it is motion-like at times. Um, the thing I think I like a little bit more about is a little bit more purpose and intentionality to every cut and every screen and action. But that's, that's the first thing, keep the purity of the game. Second one is pacing the full court, pacing the half court. They can prepare for what you do. They, can, they cannot prepare for the pace you run it at. And I think that's a big, that's a theme that you kind of heard tonight is um, they can prep, they can prepare, but if you run at a great pace, um, 
no matter what it is, it's very tough to guard, very tough to prepare for. We're, I, I've kept kind of my philosophy when it comes to playing fast. We go off makes and misses. Uh, our goal is to push it as fast as we can to flow into offense as seamlessly as we can and get the defense scrambling and hopefully chasing us for the whole possession. I tell our guys all the time, just because you play fast does not mean you have to shoot fast. Just because you play fast does not mean you have to shoot fast. So we're trying to put stress. If we get the shot we want, which we try to define, um, then we'll take it. But if not, we need to get into our concepts and our actions and, and get the basketball moving. For us, we want free it to be free-flowing yet purposeful. And then we want freedom within the structure. Free-flowing yet pur purposeful freedom within the structure. Ball movement flowing from action to action. Every pass, cut, screen, dribble should have a purpose. We try to be very intentional in every single action. And then we want our guys that freedom to, to make those reads that, that flow from our different concepts and, and our different actions. Next one, consistency yet flexibility. I touched on this earlier. We want our guys to know what to expect from year to year, but also understand that we're going to try to tweak it to, to what they do. So if we have more of a true post player, we'll play the, the Princeton concept stuff more this way. If we um, have more, we've had this first past couple of years, more pick and pop guys, we'll play that way. We just try to tweak our concepts and, and adjust as we'll show you on film here in ways that exemplify and, and kind of develop their skill. Um, I think it gives a great game plan for skill development. The, the concepts, the actions, we're able to attack the particular skills that our guys need to have and develop it, which I think is really important, especially when we don't have off season at the Division three level. So we're able to dive into it. We're able to take time and practice and be really intentional about what we do. There's clear skills. Our guys know exactly where the shots are going to come from, which is, I think, really, really important as well. And the last thing is, um, it's not a huge thing, but I like being a little bit different. I like being creative in the Midwest. There's not a lot of teams, or at least in the Wisconsin area, there's not a lot of teams running the Princeton stuff. Um, so I think it gives a little bit of, a, of an advantage. I think it's a little bit tougher prep. Um, I kind of feel like a lot of people run the same thing now, nowadays. I mean, it's a copycat business. Uh, a lot of people are running a lot of the same stuff, which is great stuff. But we kind of want to be a little bit different and, and adjust it. I can reiterate for sure the value in terminology, right, which you've heard, heard a lot tonight from Zach especially. We have a term for everything. So a couple of years ago, I went to meet with the coach, actually at my alma mater. He's now the head coach, Jim Weitzel uh, at Buffalo. And I just kind of picking their brain about some transition stuff when they also was there, they were playing pretty fast. So I wanted to pick his brain. But one of the things he told me that they did when they got the job is they all sat down as a staff and they really dove into terminology for every single action. They took the time that everyone brought terms to the table and kind of meshed it out and said, we're going to call this uh, down screen this, we're going to call ball screen this, we're going to call pop this, we're going to, whatever you want to call the action. They, they took the time to do it. And that's something we did with our staff right away when, when I got here a little bit later that summer. Because we tried to dive into the terminology. And I think the terminology is huge, especially with our stuff, which is a little bit more complex when it comes to learning stuff. We're picking up the concepts, picking up the actions. And I think it's great to have that, that own language, to have that exclusivity, as, as was mentioned earlier, to have um, the ability to call particular actions, even when our stuff, without the defense really knowing what, what we're trying to get into. So I can call a particular action, like I can say, all right, let's go overburn with the stack and try to hit the dot. And, and some people might know, but, but some might not as well. So that's uh, the terminology thing has been big for us, and, and I'm a big, big believer in it. Um, so when people think, think Princeton, a lot of times they're thinking slow and methodical, low scoring, kind of grind you out like the old Princeton back in the day. And then they're thinking about predictable, predictable and overly structured. And, and our goal is to not be that way, obviously. We want to push it, we want to put stress on the defense. We want to, I mean, we want to get to the 80s, 85 a game. Um, ideally is the goal. Obviously, it's something that's dependent on personnel and how fast you, you really can play. Uh, but uh, I'm an offensive guy. That's that's kind of where where I want to get to if it's efficient, obviously. Um, and we're getting the shots the shots we want. In addition to that, if we do this the right way, I think we can make it tough for the defense to really understand what what is coming when when it's free flowing the right way, when we're attacking the right way. Um, it's uh, I think it'd be pretty tough to guard, and it can be pretty tough to anticipate. So we've tried to take like the structure of Princeton. Um, some of these actions you're going to see are, are going to be familiar, um, but we try to do little tweaks that maybe are a little bit different than, than some Princeton teams. So we have some standard weak side action comment, our, our weak side action screening 
concepts that, that we get to. So anytime you'll see this on film, and I'll point it out. Anytime there's a stationary tandem side, we're trying to set a flare screen. Um, we get a lot of shots off that. Surprisingly, we get to the rim a lot off of it because people are worried about that screening action. Um, so we're able to turn the corner and get downhill. And if they help at all, especially with teams playing pack line, we, we get a lot of catch and shoot threes on, on that flare screen off the action, which you'll see on film. If it's a single side, so like in, we call it a way, um, where the ball goes to the high post and you down screen away and that guy back cuts or curls it and gets out opposite. We'll just space that one. We, I, we haven't set that down screen. Some people set it down screen. Um, we just try to space just to, to create as much space and opportunity to, to make a play. The other one is the true, we call it triple side. Um, <clears throat> we've done a couple of different things on this. So this is when there's two on the side and one more is coming like off over, they back cut it and going opposite. We've done the wide pin down that, that's actual that they do, um, that pin down action. Or we've also done a, a double stagger screen as well, kind of like a, a classic UCLA type action where they back screen and ball screen and stagger on the, on the weak side. Uh, played around with both. Um, there'll be some personnel dependent as well. Um, one of the NBA concepts we've incorporated into it, you'll see this on film, is we have a roll pop option on a ball screen. And whenever that happens, if we roll, we lift behind or we shake, like some people call it. If we pop, we're 45, 45 cutting it like a lot of NBA teams do. Um, so if there's a pop, we would cut that. You'll see it. Um, there's opportunity on the cut. There's opportunity on, on the pop as well. Um, one other thing we do, we put different guys in the, the high post. So depending on matchups, depending on what other people are doing, um, we find ways to, to put different people in that position. It's important for us that every single guy know every single guy knows every single spot on the floor. So we can be a little bit positionless in how we approach it. And then the last thing we do, and I got this from Lenny, is we combine chin and point into the same thing. So a lot of Princeton teams, they'll go more like the point stuff um, with, we call it spin or return. We have added chin as an option as well, which we'll show you how, how we'll get into it. Um, all these actions then start to flow and blend together. So it's really playing out of concepts. And I'll five is, is big for us when it comes to getting into a possession. So if we push it, you broke yeah. up for two seconds. Can you just start that sentence over? Or just really yeah. Long? So the, the question was, how do we start the possession? So like we want to flow as seamlessly into offense as, as, as possible. So if the five is the rim runner, then we can flow into some of our normal prints and entries when it comes to forwards out, which a lot of people call it, when it comes to um, just hitting slot to slot and, and playing off that, when it comes to hitting the five and cutting both tops and hitting the wing and dribbling up. Um, so with different options we can get into off of just to create movement and create, create some flow before we get into the actions. If the five is the trail, then we go right into, we call it home base or five out. Um, and I'll dive into that here in a little bit. But there's some different concepts and actions we, we run off that as well. Um, at the most basic form, the possession is triggered when we go slot to slot. So we'll do different things. And there's, there's different options if they take that away. But once we go slot to slot, we kind of get in that basic Princeton setup where there's a top, where there's a wing, and then there's a corner, a high post, and then a corner opposite the basketball. And then from there, you can throw the ball to the eye or you can go – throw the ball to the wing and do the chin stuff and, and, and play from there. I'm going to switch to a coach base app and kind of show you some stuff on, um, on the, the board or whatever you want to call it. And then we'll dive into some film and, and go from there. Any questions initially while I'm, I'm processing, flipping over. All right, let's dive in. Let me know if you can, you can see this. All right. Everyone see this? All right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when we, when we get into this the situation, kind of the, the spot I'm, I'm, I was talking about the basic Princeton setup, um, there are multiple actions we can do. I'll show you point over, point away, chin, and that kind of how we get into the five out. Um, five out home base look as well so obviously over the ball goes to the high post and we're going over the the ball to the screen for the corner from here the the reads are pretty simple we try to simplify it. um the two in this situation he can he can back cut it 
or he can use it. Um, we've played around with curling a little bit from this spot, right? But right now, just for simplicity's sake, those are the two options. If he uses it right here, he's trying to come off hard, and then one is stepping in to a flare screen, and three just steps straight back. If we start diving or going to the corner more, the angle is really tough. But he's just trying to blindside screen him, and <clears throat> he steps right back here. Five out of this hand up, handoff opportunity, he has a chance to bounce it. He can bounce it, and we cut that right there so there's no stunt. Or he can dive it, and we shake or, or lift behind. So that's over. Pretty simple, pretty basic. Um, I'll go into a um, – if we burn it, or a back cut, burn is a back cut for us. Ball comes here. He back cuts. He pops right here, and we can get into a ball screen right here. And then there's either the down screen from the three, depending on what we're doing, or we'll look at – Stay your stay your in it right here for that to create to take away the help and then you can dive or he can he can bounce from there. Um so that's over. I'll let me dive into a way. I just want to run through these real quick and then get into the, the good stuff when it when it comes to the film. So a way is pretty standard. A lot of people have run this, a lot of people run pieces of this stuff, but um run the away action. So from here we kind of get we've given our guys two options more. Um we added a third one that I'm not sure about this pastor when it comes to using it for a handoff, but they can burn it or they can curl it, to, uh, depending on what their, the defense is doing. From here, we're popping back and we're just getting to that ball screen, chasing it, getting out, spacing, as much spacing as possible, and then same thing. He can bounce it and we cut. He's reading it. If the ball gets thrown back, then he goes. Or he can dive and shake just like that. Um, so that's the point stuff. Um, we, my first year when we ran this stuff, we started with just point and then we started with spin. And there's a lot of things you can do off spin. But what really took this thing to the next level for us was when we entered or added the, the chin stuff. So um, what happens is obviously the ball's not going to the eye. The ball's getting sent to the wing. And there's that flare screen. And um, <clears throat> the two has to read it. Right, so if, if his defender is fighting over the top, that's a hard curl to the rim. We're, you'll see that in film. We get that a decent amount for his lifting up, ready to skip it if, if they help. From here, if he doesn't get it, he gets out, and now we're into five out, which you can do, as you saw tonight, you can do a myriad of different options. For us, we have given him two. This past year, we gave him two. The first year here, we did some different stuff, so we're always playing around with kind of this, this setup, this concept. We'll pass it, ball screen, and chase it. And anytime there's that tandem side, we flare screen, and then he's cutting opposite, and he's bouncing. We're trying to make a play off of that. Zach, the other thing, and yep, go ahead. So on that on that initial flare, yep. So the top the top flare, we we, we talked about this a bunch with our staff this year, uh, with with the five flaring. Do you teach your footwork to? And I talked a little bit to Doug Novak about this. Does, do you teach your guy to go into the defender or do you teach your guy just to backpedal? Because I've seen it two different ways. Loyola uh, a couple years ago taught going into the defender and then see what he does. But Campbell, they just send their guy back and then they just make – like they just read the defender from there. So I, I didn't know how you taught it or how – Yeah, that's a good question. Are you talking about this flare screen right here? Yeah, exactly. Like yep. the chin flare screen? So the four in this position? Yep. Okay, yeah. So we – like – if you, if you talk to Lenny, he would just drift it. So, like, they don't even set it up or anything. They yeah. just start drifting it right here, and they try to hit him. We've taught more setting it up. Um, I don't know, I'm playing around with it a little bit. We've gotten a lot up out of the chin stuff, so um, I'm not sure I want to mess around with it too much. Yeah. But we set it up. We take two or three steps um, kind of down, and then he's stepping into it and, and reading it. So that's kind of what we – how we've approached it. In, in that situation, I feel like if you go into the defender, it's just gonna, you're, he's just gonna connect to you anyway, rather than just. I think you're right. I think just drifting back and just backpedaling it immediately, and then just see what the defender does, because he might just try to shoot the gap under. I didn't know if you ran into any issues with that or not, but it seems like you just do the drift, which is or fine. Yeah. So like, we get into issues when the when three with the ball just gets robotic and it just throws the basketball, <laughs> yeah. like. If we do it correctly, this guy's reading the screen. We do a lot of, like, breakdown drills, reading all these screens and stuff. If he reads it correctly, they jump it, and that's a, that's a tight curl. Yeah. That, that should be a layup or a skip because they're, they're helping. Or what happens a lot is the five will help, and then that's, we want to have five guys on the floor as much as possible who all can shoot it. Um, the five will step to the top of the key, and, and that's a catch and shoot. So does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. 
right, yep, cool. So like we would go reverse back and down a home base, reverse and then ball screen, or we would also return back to the same side. And this now to that more delay action where three would down screen, he would come off, dribble handoff, he could bounce or dive, kind of that concept, and then we'd have our weak side screen concept as well. That was pretty good for us, um, and, and you will also see that one on film. Um, so that's more if we curl it hard. So let's say we kind of go back here, just trying to get through this this quickly. Um, the ball goes to the three and the five flare screens. When we get a catch, so they probably have to be a little bit higher. When we get a catch right here, he's thinking two things. He's thinking shot, and if there's no shot, he's thinking rip. And we do a lot of work on ripping uh, on these actions um, with all players. That's, that's one of the skills we feel like they need to be able to do is catch a shoot, catch a, catch the rip, and, and put the ball on the floor. Um, in this situation, when he's thinking shot, he's thinking drive. And then we treat – excuse me, we treat this situation kind of like dribble drive. We call it corner rage with the one and the two. If he's above this third hash, five just steps to the top of the key, two is just stretching. He's just ready to catch a shoot. We're looking for early kick. We work on this a lot. Um, early kick for the shot. You can drive it out there as well. As, sec as soon as he gets lower and two is looping up and he's looking to catch a shooter, looking to drive that gap as well. Um, that's just something we kind of try to incorporate as we try to open this stuff up as we get better players here at Lawrence. We're trying to find different ways, like hey, what are our driving opportunities in this stuff that's not so structured that there's freedom and it's free flowing to, to do it. Um, and this is one of them that we found. So if two doesn't have a drive, isn't able to get the rim, he's kicking it to five, and then we're right back into our, in our home base concepts where we can go either way, either direction. Um, the last thing I'm going to show before we kind of dive into film is what we've elected to do right now, and, and I'm playing around some different stuff in, in, in transition, is um, if the five is the trail, because we, we play a lot – we have a lot more perimeter players right now than really rim runners – and um, we've just elected not to have rim runner if the five's the trail, and we're looking to push. And if the one can get in the paint, great. If we can reverse it opposite, kind of that two-sided break, great. Um, but if we can't, then we're flowing right into home base. So we're not waiting for, like, okay, he pushes it. The five has to get to his spot. Like, I just think it takes too long. So we try to flow into offense as quick as possible. So the ball might go right here and get reversed into our reverse or might flip back into flip. And then we kind of play from there and, and teach our guys how to, to connect and flow from action to action. Um, so that's kind of the, um, the base of what we do from a, a, a schematic um, standpoint. And we can dive into film here in, in a second, kind of return back to the screen. All right, cool. Any questions about some of the concepts and, and how all that flows and all that? This might be an elementary question. Um, yeah. I guess I'm so skewed by the NBA. Like, we're just all pick and roll. Yep. And I understand, like, the few times you, you talked about getting to some screens maybe. But, like, how much – trying to ask the right way. Just, like, how, how many pick and rolls do you guys run a game? Or, like, how many options do you have that get to screens? Uh, yeah, um, it actually gets into more – ball screen stuff than you'd expect um because i mean i would say like very rarely do we get into the second action just because we, we get pretty good looks off of the first one um but if we get in the second one there's at least two or three in possession with a lot of movement with a lot of um kind of manipulating the defense with the the 45 cuts and, and the weak side stuff so we actually get into it and do it more than you would expect um, and I think you'll see that on film. Like it's a little bit hard when you, you just right, look yeah. at the 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 board. Um, yeah, but yeah. I wanted to kind of break that down before we we dive into it. But we uh, we get into it a good amount. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ryan, do you want to pull it up? I had some issues with our Wi-Fi here, so my assistant actually is going to pull it up and um, show it. Okay, so here's here's over. Um, 
obviously sprinting over the basketball. Time is a little off, but get a pretty good shooter a shot early in the possession. I'm gonna try to show you a couple clips of each action, and then we'll show you more. It'll be more helpful when you can see how it all kind of flows together. Here you're gonna see, so we put um, whoever the big guy was guarding, he was guarding the high post, or that guy was gonna be the high post in this position. So we put our four in that spot um, because we wanted this. We knew it was gonna be really hard. They're gonna they're gonna play soft. It's gonna be really hard to, to play soft and get back on the bounce. Two in the corner, or it's gonna be um, three in the corner. He angle cuts right there. We call it angle cut um, and creates that that kind of decision for his defender. Do I stunt or do I get back? So here's a way, a lot of you are pretty familiar with it. So it's a twins cut, tandem cut. Um, they they deny the pop, so he does a good job reading. The second opportunity to back up. Then obviously this is something we need to get get more of. So what Nebraska was, and like if you watch them, they do a really good job of is seeing that corner. Um, like if the help comes from the corner, they do a really good job skipping. It was just something we need to do a little bit better job. Hey, um, uh, so here's here's yeah, go ahead. Ryan, can you go back? I think it's three clips. I think it's this, yeah. Can this you one? pause it? Double back it. Uh, sorry, can you go to the clip before this? My bad. Can you pause it right there? So that kid who just cut through, like I know earlier yeah. you were talking about the single side and the the triple side, like that mm -hmm. that left side of the court right now. What what are you referring to? That so that that to me would be the single side. It's going to be a tandem, but it's really hard. Like we wouldn't want to flare screen that one because the corner is there's no way you could get up there in time. Okay, so, so we've elected like some people, some Princeton teams, they'll down screen like the top wing will down screen. Yeah. for the guy cutting through. We just have elected just a space in this situation gotcha. because I don't I want him to be able to turn the corner and get to the rim and, and right. um make those reads which which he does here. So that's what I would refer to we just refer to it as a single side because it was single. Yep. Um when the, the action started if that makes sense. Yeah. So like a lot of NBA teams now, that guy on the wing is setting like that corner pin in almost for yep. the, for the guy cutting through. Which I, yeah, that's and that's I, classic Princeton. Yeah, and that's like, is it taken away from the ball handler get into the rim, maybe? Um, but yeah, I was just thinking. Yeah, about it's, it. it's something I've I've kicked around a little bit. I, we'll see. I mean, it'll depend on personnel. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, a little bit. You, no, you're good. Ever, you're good. Do you guys ever send that like the chin cutter uh, on the other side of the screen to like brush off a little bit? I, I don't know if you're about to get into that or not, just to mess it up. Uh, um, let, let me dive into it and come back to that question if gotcha. that's cool at the end because and, and hopefully we hit on it. Um, so this one right here, like pause it around quick. So if you go back a little bit, this is one of the, the kind of next level stuff that we need to get better at reading at. Um, stop. Like that could be a skip for a wide open shot right there. Like we, we need to get more, I mean, in full disclosure, like there's so much you can get out of this away stuff that our guys are still kind of figuring out and learning. Obviously, we get a back cut here, um, but there, and you see, you've seen like the the double back cut. But there's skips available. There's the ball screen stuff. Um, it's a pretty tough action. I know um, Acup has said that's no matter where he is in the country, that's an action he would run, and 
I think it's it's been pretty effective, but there's some stuff we got to get a little bit better at reading. So this is the chin stuff, which is an option. This is not a call. Just kind of it flows out. There's one one action I'll, I'll show you um, that I'll explain when we get there. So obviously there's a catch and shoot. In this situation, we had the big guy guarding on the perimeter, so we're we're trying to just play with the defense a little bit. Um, So stop it, Ryan. Okay, so this is the concept um, we call it pitch back. Where can you go back a little bit? Where what teams were starting to do is they were starting to help from the five. And what we do, we treat it just like a ball screen. We angle cut that right there. And what you'll see on the catch, so pop, play it and stop it quick. Stop. 25 is open if you want to see. He puts the uh, five's defender on an island. Do I stunt? or do I go with the cutter? And we're trying to create that indecision and give him that read. Um, in this situation, he gets a wide open shot. Um, there's been times, I don't think we have clips of that here, but there are times during the season we got layups off it as well. Um, this is a real, it's been a really, really good action for us. Um, and here's, here's kind of a, a clip that shows it. Here you'll see the hard curl. Once we get into it. And it could be a skip there as well. Here's the rip downhill drive. So here's the clip you're going to see kind of – it flows pretty well. It gets us into a home base option where we reverse it. Tight curl with a shake. Here, here you will see, um, <clears throat> once we get into it, the corner read option as well with the space and trying to kind of take advantage of that driving opportunity. So it kicks it. So here's like the here's the five outlook. You'll see it kind of out of um, the chin stuff, and then you'll see it also out of transition. Here's return back to the same side with the flare screen weak side. I don't love this flow into the possession, but we we get get to it. So here you'll see return back with the uh, he pops it on the handoff with the angle cut. Excellent. So exactly. reverse the weak side, and this time we get the player. Yeah. Um, in your practices, I feel like a lot of Princeton teams run a lot of offense five on zero. Like they go through their stuff to like get all the actions and reads and stuff, as opposed to mm -hmm. like playing five versus five v five, where they get live live defense. What's your philosophy or practice with that? With practice with your offense? Yeah, we do a lot more. Like we. we... I mean, obviously, early when you're teaching this stuff because it's it's a little more complex. You got to do a lot of five on zero. 
But man, I want to get as many live reps as possible. So we'll do a short segment of five and zero, but then we're trying to get to the five and five, whether it be an action breakdown where we do a lot of where a lot of people do, and we're probably going to do a little bit more three and three and four on four stuff, breaking down some actions. But a lot of people um, do those. We've kind of got more because we do the weak side actions where it's a lot of like five on five perfect perfect possession where I say, okay, you're in the chin action or you're in away action, and if you don't get a shot at this action, it's a turnover. So it's forcing you to read screens. It's forcing you to, to do a lot of that stuff. So um, we kind of like to do more of those. And then we get into a lot of uh, five and five full core, five and five half core stuff. Um, that's kind of more, more the way we've gone. Cause I, I want these guys getting good at reading it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of teams that have been phenomenal five on five and over and they can't translate. And it's been big for us to get to the point where we can read this stuff effectively and play at the pace that we want to play at in the half court. Yeah. Cool. So here, here's home base, oh, we call home base, five out, out of transition. Spacing is okay, probably gonna get corners a little more, but turn the corner and hit the flare screen. And here's another one, this time we reverse it. And then drive the shake. So this will be hopefully be helpful here. This is kind of showing the flow of the possession now where it's not as just kind of broken down. You'll see kind of how action flows from, from action to action and concept to concept. Like I said earlier, we're just when there's something we got to continue to explore and get better at is um, transition and, and how to get that. Um, but once we get the possession, but we don't want that we, as quickly as possible. We want to be able to flow from one action to action without losing the the freedom to make plays off the bounce and um, attack those opportunities. So Zach, those last two clips and probably this one too, like you're calling home base and then right now you guys are just playing. They're just playing all this stuff. Right. So none of this is called. And we have a lot of counters and sets we run off this stuff. I've kind of dealt like dove into um, some of the two guard stuff because it looks the same to start. I might dive into some of the spread stuff because it looks the same to start. But this is just our base. This is just our flowing from action to action, concept to, to concept. Hey Zach, how often do you see zone defense in your league, and does that change? Does that change your approach uh, offensively? No, that's, that's a good question. So we, one of the things we've done pretty well here is we we shoot it pretty well, so we haven't seen a lot of, of zone. Um, and because of that our our zone offense, we try to keep pretty basic, pretty pretty fundamental. Um, but <clears throat> where I was at before, we saw a little bit more. But Ryan, can you go back in this one and just pause real quick? Um, maybe, uh, I think it's, it's kind of like we talked about earlier, knowing what your personnel can handle and knowing what, um, if your guys have the ability to, to handle some of this stuff, cause I've gotten to the point where I, I believe in this stuff where I probably would stick to it. Even if I saw a good amount of zone, um, we do play some zones. So we get uh, defensively. So we get some reps against zone and, and that. So we're able to attack that side of things as well but it does take some time to learn and, and you, you got to work on it to like anything but you got to work on it to to be good at it um but i i, I think i would i would keep it and, and keep my riding with it okay but okay you can play around so reverse it and home base we didn't screen the weak side there follow the next action and here's that pitch back look again because they help and then 22 is cut Uh, hey Zach, real quick. Um, yep. I've watched a lot of this stuff, um, and there's there's 
let me ask, let me just ask this is, are you, yep. what's more important to you getting the screen set or playing with the pace and making the correct read? Cause I think teams that run a lot of this stuff, like I've heard some teams say like, we just want the defense to come together so we can figure out what their coverage is and then we'll read that. And then I've heard other people say, no, we want to set the screen so that we can do X, Y, Z. Um, yeah. That's a good, that's a good question. We've kind of combined both a little bit where we work a lot on reading screens. We do like two on one dead ball screen. Can you go back a second, Ryan? Um, we, yeah. All right, cool. Um, yeah, just pause it. We do like those the screening breakdowns because my thing is if, if we set good screens, we kind of feel like, um, we're going to get the shots we want because yeah. we're doing different things to manipulate the defense, whether it be cutting that, um, the, the guy under the ball screen in the 45 cut or um, flaring the weak side, weak side. So we talk a lot about screen and talk a lot about cutting. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, we're preaching pace as well. So like we're, it's kind of going hand in hand. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but like okay. those are probably the two most important ingredients for our stuff yeah. is can we play with pace? That's two probably things we emphasize the most. Can we play with pace and can we screen and cut? Um, Because we feel like, and I think it's when we execute the way we want to execute, um, there's really only a couple ways to that we found that it's been hard for us to attack um, and ways we can get better at. But it's because we're playing with pace and we're screening and and we're doing that kind of stuff. So um, those are probably two biggest emphasis points for us in our stuff. So I know it doesn't really answer that, but like that's what we're preaching all the time, both those things. Okay, thanks. Hey, Zach, yeah, just to get yep. to, you could put this in your notebook if you want, but um, from playing against from playing against good Princeton teams in our league, to be honest with you, I I really feel like the pace is more puts more pressure on you than than the actual setting the good screen. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. I mean the pace like you can't you can't simulate that. Um, you just can't from a defensive standpoint. Yeah, you know? like William C. Yep years ago and like if you watch Colby like now it, I don't even know how much they really screw they just like it, it's like we're a bunch of ants running around and they just yeah. shoot. <laughs> and especially because how yours is interchangeable you've spoken about that you know like the old Williams teams like listen they they would kill you they could probably have done whatever they wanted but they're mm-hmm. they're screening and coming together they had the post presence threat with the big guards and stuff looking at your stuff with your size, because I asked Trav, like, are they trying to screen or not? But I'm t- my, my personal opinion defensively, like, forget about teaching the screen, keep the pace. <laughs> keep the pace. <laughs> and know? that's what ultimately, like, like I said earlier, they can prepare for what you do. They can't prepare for the pace you do it at. Yes. They can't duplicate it. Um, so I'm, I'm all on board with that. I do think, like, with some of the stuff we're doing on the weak side, like, you got to hit bodies, obviously. You can't yeah. just exchange. Yeah. Um, so that's where, like, we emphasize – I mean, those are the two things we're preaching all the time. Like, you got to get the ball moving. We got to play with pace. There can't be any hiccup. And then um, read the screens and, and um, make contact. So, because when, when you run the away stuff, you know, and when you have, sense. and when you have the, when you run the away stuff, when you have that tandem at the elbow, like, mm-hmm. that's the second cut with the pace of that is like, it, it, it's impossible. It's impossible to get, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, Ryan, go back to the last one, actually, before this. And this, this kind of shows the pace where I want – I think this is a pretty good clip to show the pace that we're, we're building towards and, and working on. First possession of the game, which is sometimes a little bit easier, but you'll see kind of how the ball's popping. We're making quick decisions, and we get a pretty, pretty open shot. So it curls it, and then you hear you see the weak side gets preoccupied with the screen in action, and and we get the dive. I think this is another one where you see that as well. Watch the help. They're all worried about 
the weak side. Hey Zach, what's giving you what's giving you problems? Like, what do you see, or what do teams try to do? Like, what's keeping you up like at night over the summer? Like that you're getting ready for? Yeah, well, the biggest thing is, and a lot of you probably can can guess this. There, the pitch back is the switching stuff is been our our hearts just because we have personnel currently uh, when we play pretty positionless, we recruit pretty positionless. Where um, that's been the hardest thing for us to attack is, is the teams that switch everything with our current personnel. Some of that is that we, as we continue to build this, we got to get better players that can take advantage of those mismatches and, and all that stuff. Um, there's some different things we probably can do schematically. That, um, that's kind of one of the things I want to dive into a little bit more. Um, but that's probably been the most effective. Um, I, I, I honestly believe, and I don't mean this to, to sound arrogant, like if we do what we're supposed to with the pace and the screening and cutting, I kind of feel like that's the only way to guard it, to be honest with you because of the screening actions and the different concepts we're, we're doing out of it. Um, so that's probably, if we can, if we can continue to grow in that area, I'll feel, I'll feel pretty good. And even, even switching like with the pace, that pace, it's yep. tough to, it's it's tough to, to switch that, yeah. and be with people. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially change it, get to the second or third side and then, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Without a doubt. Do you put restrictions on like, the size of the kids that you recruit because you want to be positionless or are you not comfortable? So, like, I talk to the guys at Nebraska Wesley and they're like, I yeah. don't know it really is right there. Like, we don't recruit kids who are under six whatever and over six whatever. Like, have you tried – have you been successful trying to do that? Yeah, so I – and mean, I talked to Dale a lot about it. We're pretty good friends. Um, we, we would like to get to the point where everyone is between a certain height range. Um, at the same point, we – and this is where I talk about um, you have to have flexibility within your system to, yeah. to adjust. So, like, we don't have a true post player right now. If we find a true post player that has the academic grades and interest in coming to Lawrence, um, I think we can find ways to, to plug it into the Prince and stuff and, and do some different things. Um, where Nebraska was, and they're, they're putting – it's pretty it's pretty interesting. Like they're putting guards at the high post, and they're diving and posting big guards. And stuff. We just don't have the personnel to, to do that. Um, currently, so we're going more to some of the other actions and some of the other things and some of the other reads. So yes, we'd like to get to the point where it's really um, everyone's between six three, six six, positionless. Um, we can put different guys in different spots, which we toy around a little, a little bit. But at the same time, when we find a five eleven guard that can really play. Like we're going to take that right now. Um, I, I've tried so, to. Yeah. I just ended up with like four massive kids, so we can't do this. So, yeah, I'm 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 with you. That's, uh, but I think what you can do is is what we've done is, we kind of picked who should we put in the high post based on what the opponent is doing. If it's if they're going to play soft or drop coverage, and have a big lumbering big, and they're not going to switch it. Okay, if we we pick and pop and, and cut that, there's no way he's getting it back, and that's a shot or a rip in the drive. Um, okay, but maybe this the next time we the mix it up, we want that big to guard on the perimeter now, so we can put someone else in the high post, and then we're going to kind of play off off that, um, which you saw in the clip earlier. So um, that's kind of more the direction we've gone, where we can switch around who we have in the the high post, but we just don't the personnel to really do what Nebraska was and does does yeah, even though I love what they do. Um, it hasn't. It doesn't fit us quite yet. So one of the driving opportunities we try to talk about is this hitting the flare screen and ripping baseline and then feeling opposite, um, or feeling corner. And I've played around with some of the stuff Zach you were saying earlier with with cutting that top and um, kind of treating the the driving opportunity. I think that's the next level for us in this stuff is is getting to the point where it's free flowing and we, and guys know what okay, these are the opportunities to attack the rim and how do we space off of it in transition, but also in, in the in the half court. So here you just see a reversal. Good player makes makes the read. So here's one other look, and, and this is one of my favorite things about it. I'll show you one more little look. We we had more success my first year in it. But we we'll have times where we just drop the high post and we'll do the same entries, whether it be handoffs or whether it be 
um, different. We hit the, the high post right away and cut the top and throw the ball to the wing. They dribble up and they're just exchanging spots. And then we'll get into more of a dribble drive look. We're going to show you a few clips. and um, it, It's more of a pattern look. It's not as free-flowing. Uh, but it's just, again, another look that starts the same way but, but gives our guys a, a little bit different look. And what we do with the, the, the post player is if he can shoot it, we just put him in the corner and you'd be amazed how many times that five just kind of falls asleep and helps and we get a wide catch and shoot three. So there's – we call it a slice cut. This is the last one, Zach. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the gist of what we do. Um, that's kind of the base of, of how we operate. Um, I think one of my favorite things about it is there's a lot of ways, and I'll try to wrap this up soon. I know it's getting late. Um, there's a lot of ways to, like, play around with different concepts within it. So, for example, like the five-out stuff, if you wanted to, to teach some of the actions you saw earlier from Zach um, or – like one that, that I've seen that played around with is the Bucks stuff, right? Where they throw the ball to the trail, reverse it and pin down and get into a ball, either a step up ball screen or, or get throw right at a point. Um, there's a lot of different options you can do out of kind of that five out home base look that we, we play around with. The other one we didn't talk a lot about is, is call it, um, you can call it return real spin where you go to throw the ball in high post and you spin back and dribble at that, that wing and he cuts. There's a lot of things you can do off that as well. Um, that we play around. One of the things we play around is a two guard look off of that, where the guy who back cuts, um, he stops, the ball gets thrown to the wing, you cut to the corner, ball gets reversed to the, the post player who steps up top, reverse option, there's our, the shuffle up. Um, the two guard kind of shuffle the back cutter, back screens, down screens. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do off that. Obviously, if you get a true big, you can look at some of the low post series stuff um, when we show you the where we drop the center. So, um, there's a lot of structure. That's the last kind of my last point. There's a lot of structure for creativity. Um, a lot of structure that we try to take like the basic Princeton concepts and just figure out, Hey, how can we add different NBA concepts we've seen? How can we add different actions we've seen into the gist of, of what we do? Um, so like that, that baseline drive concept or rejecting a ball screen concept, cutting the top is one I've played around with and just some other stuff. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we we've developed and what we're doing. Um, stole a lot of it, but been been pretty pleased with with what we got. So that's awesome. Really good stuff, Zach. Impressive video work, Ryan. It's hard to to play when someone else is talking. No, we're we're good. We we practice it a lot. <laughs> cool. uh, I don't know any other any maybe one or two questions. I'll just say this, Zach. You should you should check out Colby because you might steal a thing or two from them to to throw That's into great. your stuff. Yeah, I mean they they kind of try to get it with the pace. They really play it with shit. They they play with five guards sometimes. You know, <laughs> like it's it's crazy. And I know for us, it put a bind on us. Like who or where were we trying to put our center? You know. Yep. Um. I mean, they damn near played him off the off the court. You know, because of it because of it and they had the shooting to go like your personnel and their personnel looks really similar really similar yeah, yeah. no that's that's good that's very helpful we'll dive into that one for sure well good stuff i was planning to try to do some breakout rooms again but we'll save that for for another week um Obviously, really good stuff, Zach. If you, if your name's Zach, good stuff. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hammer, they kind of picked up the slack for you, but we'll include you in there. <laughs> uh, I know Jenny's left us, but obviously, really good stuff from her as well. Um, and I think it's just funny, like all of these different systems. Like there really is no perfect system. Maybe Zach, you disagree, <laughs> and system. No, I, is I perfect. Completely. But like it's just and something you said like and a couple of people have said it tonight. It's just such a copycat industry, right? And in the NBA, everyone's running the same stuff. And now 
Awesome. There's no patent on schemes, man. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, no, what just that, one thought. Hold that... that... oh, that. Go ahead. One thing I love, man, I, and I, I'm thinking about it a little bit, uh, two things is that top of the key flare. I, I, I just – I keep coming back to that whenever I see that. It's just such a – it can be so good because you can curl that and you can get that cutter laid over the top. And if they guard it, you're just naturally in such great spacing. Like you said, you're in home base and you hit that five and you can play from there. Um, that's something that just – it's really kind of sticking to me a little bit. And, like, Davidson will get to that not running print symbol. but will get to that same concept. Mm-hmm. It's such a hard action to guard. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, like, it made all the difference, and Ryan can, can attest to this. Like, it made all the difference in the world when we added that part because that's, that's been the best action for us. Like, the other stuff I, is more I, the person That's the best one. That's, that's the best one. One of the things yeah, you I'm, talked about is you, you talked about with the cutters and throwing the skips, uh, something that makes sense for me when I heard it was you're looking to throw to cutters and you're looking to throw behind cutters. Mm-hmm. So, on that action, hey, if we can't throw to the cutter, but, you know, that corner guy sinks in. Let's look to throw to cutters. Let's look to throw behind cutters or over the top of cutters. Yeah, I like that. No, that's good. You know, I was just thinking about that. That's a, a good Coffee. way to put it. It's a good way to put it. Zach, no, I appreciate that. No, that's good. Zach from Lawrence, uh, something we did at Loyola, I don't know if you guys had, have done this at all, but, like, we talked a lot about, like, guys in, in transition, when you kick it ahead, they jump into, like, the help. We, we like to do that flare and transition, and we got so much stuff out of it. I don't know if that's something you guys could add or look at, but. Huh, yeah, we might have to connect. I, yeah. I definitely would be interested in learning more about that. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's like, it's just pretty direct. Like, uh, we got a bunch out of it, but yeah, for sure. I know it's late. No, that, yeah, yeah, send that over, please. That, that, that'd be great. And one thing, um, Jonah, based on, on what you said, like, there is no perfect system, right? And it, it comes back to, like, what do you believe in? Conviction. Um, and then in addition to that, what fits what you have? <laughs> like, like, it's this is summary of the whole night. Like, um, this isn't for everyone. Uh, hopefully, this, I mean, there's some concepts that people can steal and take, but it doesn't fit everyone's personnel. And there's a lot of great ways to do it. There's a lot of people have been successful doing a lot of things. Um, but for us, this is what we believe in. This is what, what works for as works for us. Um, and, and it fits what we have. So I think that's really what it comes down to, man. What fits? What What do you believe in? What can? How do you feel like you can be the best? And then you gotta go from there. I have ran down. Run a system that you believe in that fits your personnel. I mean, <laughs> well, and then Jenny said something that was so good. I thought she said, "You can't just be a copycat coach because you'll never know your system well enough to mm-hmm. teach." And, and she might. She said it a lot better than I just said it. You know. But it was such a good point that if you keep changing what you do, you'll never know well enough to really get your guys good at it. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. I thought that was great. Absolutely. Well, I'll send a, uh, I'll send a recap email the next day or two with some of these materials and with a link, uh, a link to all these emails. Everyone enjoy the last weekend of the last dance. Should be a good last two episodes. And uh, – Thanks to those that are still here that, that grinded this one out with us. But really good stuff as always. And I, I really appreciate it, bro. Appreciate it. Yes, Thanks, 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 Thanks,